Good morning, everyone. I invite my board members to uh, come on camera here. Good morning. My name is Joaquin Esquivel. I am chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Today is Tuesday, July 20th. It is 9 a.m. and I would like to call this meeting to order. I'll begin by introducing my fellow colleagues and uh, staff here today. Joining me is Vice Chair Doreen Diadamo, board member Sean McGuire, board member Laurel Firestone, and board member Nicole Morgan. With us today as well as our executive director, Eileen Sobeck, our two chief deputies, Jonathan Bishop and Eric Oppenheimer, our chief counsel, Michael Lawfer, our clerk of the board is Janine Townsend, and assisting her today is Courtney Tyler and Margie Argel. As you can see, this meeting is being webcast and recorded. We don't have a physical meeting room and are joined here virtually on the Zoom platform. You are either joining us one of two ways. You're part of our customary webcast and just viewing uh, today's proceedings, or you're intending to comment, and in which case, you should be here on the Zoom platform with us. There are instructions on how to do so on the board uh, notice for today, but additionally, if you are having challenges, you can email comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov, and uh, Janine can help you uh, get here onto the platform if you are intending on commenting on any of our items today. Uh, when you do uh, join the platform here, your cameras will be off. You will be on mute until it is uh, your turn to come up uh, and speak on your item. Before we get to public forum this morning, we actually have a presentation of a Superior Accomplishment Awards and would like to invite uh, Karen Mogus here to, to present the award. Ah, it wasn't letting me unmute. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Chair Esquivel and members of the board, I'm Karen Mogus, Deputy Director, Division of Water Quality, and I'm pleased to be here to present a team award to the team that got the winery order over the finish line. As you recall, the board adopted the general waste discharge requirements for winery process water in January this year. And the order balances protecting groundwater quality and the costs of compliance by establishing requirements that best fit the size of a winery and the threat to water quality. It also streamlines consistent permitting across the state and provides regulatory coverage for over 2000 wineries. Today, it's my pleasure to recognize the project team who worked diligently over about six years consulting with the regional boards seeking input from a diverse range of stakeholders, conducting outreach events and workshops and visiting wineries to see operations firsthand. I can neither confirm nor deny whether wine was consumed during these visits. And uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, the team professionally and patiently listened and considered extensive and often conflicting comments, reworking the order several times to strike the right balance of water quality protection and economic impacts. And so with that, I'd like to recognize the team. There are several on the team. Um, I'm hoping that uh, for those of you willing to share your videos, um, you do that now. I'm gonna start with Laurel Wardrip. She is a senior environmental scientist in the Division of Water Quality and served as the team leader and project manager for the winery order, picking up the project in the middle after Tim O'Brien retired. She was the glue that held the team together. Her scheduling, project management skills, and extensive permitting experience in the stormwater program were invaluable for keeping things moving forward and getting it over the finish line. So thank you, Laurel. I see she's on video. Um, wave. <laughs> Next, I wanna recognize Jennifer Chen. She's a water resources control engineer uh, in the Division of Water Quality and was the lead engineer on the project. She completed countless hours of research on winery treatment systems and processes and was instrumental in drafting a workable order responding to comments and responding to questions from board members and stakeholders along the way. Uh, so she was an invaluable member of the team. All of these were invaluable members of the team. Next, I wanna recognize Stephanie Torres. Wave, Stephanie, I see you on video. Uh, she's an engineering geologist in the Division of Water Quality and relatively new to the division. And this was her first big statewide project that she worked on. She was the lead on CEQA compliance and tribal consultations and coordinated with our Office of Chief Counsel to develop solutions for concerns that were raised by affected tribes. Next, I wanna recognize Melissa Gunter who is a water resources control engineer with the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board. 
she was a great resource for us ground truthing the great requirements of the order with actual conditions in the Napa and Sonoma Creek watersheds. She coordinated with stakeholders and set up field visits. And I would very much like to give a special thanks to our colleagues at the San Francisco Bay Regional Board for allowing Melissa to help us for much longer than we originally anticipated. Um, and uh, hopefully I can uh, thank them for her coming over to work for DWQ one day, but um, that'll be in the future. Um, next, I want to recognize Aide Ortiz. Aide, I see you. Uh, she's a water resources control engineer, currently working for the Division of Drinking Water, formerly with the Division of Water Quality and hopefully back uh, to DWQ in the future as well. She was the original lead engineer for the project. Uh, midstream, uh, during the middle of the project, she was diverted to work on the cannabis water quality order, but then picked it right back up and was instrumental in developing the original order. She drafted and redrafted several versions of the order as we responded to comments and concerns of internal and external customers during the development of the order. She set up all of the stakeholder workshops and coordinated our site visits. So thank you, Ivan. Uh, next is Tim Regan. I also see him on video. He's an attorney with the Office of Chief Counsel and as, was our lead attorney on the winery order and all things waste discharge requirements for the division. So this is uh, one among many projects he advises us on. He was always available to address the multiple legal issues that arose during development of the order while juggling his numerous other responsibilities. And Tim always brings a, a calm, measured approach to uh, advising us and always a pleasure to have him on our team. Next, I wanna recognize Scott Couch, who is a super, our supervising engineering geologist in the Division of Water Quality. Scott is DWQ's resident Alabama Crimson Tide football fan. In the fall, you will see him often donning the, the appropriate colors for the day of the football game. And arguably the greatest football coach of all time, Paul Bear Bryant said, do not take credit for the success of the team, but take responsibility for the failures. Had this project been a failure, Scott says he would have taken responsibility for that. Kind of you, Scott, um, but it was a success. And while he says he didn't do very much and the credit goes to the rest of the team, which to some degree I agree with, I also want to acknowledge Scott's tireless efforts to work with the team and stakeholders to get this uh, order over the finish line. Scott was um, a solid foundation for the team, providing advice both to his staff and uh, everyone on the team, but also greasing the skids with the stakeholders and, and um, just being there as, as the foundation for the success. Finally, I want to recognize Gwyneth Granville, who is my executive assistant here in the division and is my right hand. Um, I am just taking the opportunity to add her to this team, although she is on every single one of our teams. Everything that you see come across the finish line from DWQ has been handled extensively by Gwyneth. Um, at the risk of touting her uh, wonderful qualities and how fabulous she is and uh, letting others know that uh, that she's around here at the water boards. Don't steal her. Um, I, I would say everyone needs someone like Gwyneth. Not only does she keep me organized, which you know is amazing, but she also is our liaison to the executive office. She kept the winery order on track by making sure that all of our documents were submitted correctly and on time. She always made sure we knew when critical deadlines were approaching and was willing to stay late to help when we were a little slow. And she does this for all of our projects. Not only that, but she has been our key person here in the office during the pandemic. She's been here nearly every day um, and just is absolutely the most wonderful, fabulous um, assistant I could ever ask for. I'm gonna just know that this is when the good times are because uh, uh, eventually, I won't have Gwyneth anymore, but um, really enjoy having her on our team, and she's just fabulous. So with that, I want to congratulate the whole team. Thank you so much for all of your tireless efforts, 
And um, it's just a pleasure to have you in DWQ or at least working on our team um, outside of DWQ. So thank you very much. And this is the point at which um, I, I just wanna just show you, I'm in my office today. And if you can see back here, you can see all of the awards stacking up in my office back here. So when we're back at the board meeting, we're gonna have to have a huge group picture of everyone that's received an award since, uh, since we've been in the pandemic. But um, today we'll have to give a virtual clap yet again. So thank you so much, everyone. Just thank you, Karen. I know, and I really appreciate that we've continued to to do this uh, through the last year. Although you know, it's it's a little more difficult when we're not in person. But just have to join you in acknowledging an incredible team here. I know, you know, six years sounds like a long time for a permit, but that's uh, what they take. You know, the balancing that's required, the very technical work involved in all of this, but truly the listening and the responding and the continued refinement. Uh, you know, I know that this uh, order went through a lot of that, and we use general orders here at the board to help create some streamlining across the state, help bring in some consistency in our programs. And we have nine regional boards and with very different hydrologies and very different stakeholders, especially in, in wine country. So this was a Herculean lift and just really appreciate all of you as, uh, in this in incredible work. So just thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, well, just really appreciate uh, everyone's time. And, and again, um, it's, it's important to make sure we acknowledge uh, just the incredible work that, that goes into to all of this. So I just uh, thank everyone for, for elevating um, the awards here. Uh, next, then we can move on to public forum. And I believe our first uh, public forum commenter is uh, former board member, Tam Dodak. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Tam. Great to see all of you. Great to see you as well. I, I hope the process to get onto public forum wasn't too difficult. I know. No, you've got perfect staff handling everything Good. perfectly. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for the time today. Before I get to my main reason for being here today, if I might take a moment to uh, congratulate board member Morgan and uh, thank you board member for your service during this very, very challenging time for our entire state. I, I wish you great success because the success uh, of this entire board is vital to the long-term sustainability of our precious water resources. So if I can be of assistance in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out. Again, welcome, congratulations, thank you. My, my main reason, though, for being here today is to thank everyone who participated in Saturday's cleanup event at the Yomekin River Parkway, uh, Mile 3 North. We had 56 volunteers showed up, including, of course, the chairman and board member Firestone. Thank you very much. And it's estimated that we hauled away, we cleared out uh, at least 12,000 pounds of trash. I know it was a tremendous effort and actually it was a lot more physically challenging than I, I anticipated. So I can tell you, I definitely went home with sore muscles uh, on Saturday, but also I think with a, a real sense of accomplishment, you know, for, for that space, for that period of time, we did something that improved, that made things better in that one area of Sacramento. It was a concrete accomplishment uh, that I felt very good about. And I can also tell you that uh, I, and I'm sure others, went home and had a greater appreciation for the fact that we were able to take a warm shower, we were able to drink water, we were able to rest in you know, air conditioned, uh, safe home. I think those are all you know, human basic necessities that you know, some of us take for granted and not all of us uh, are able to partake in. So I know that I definitely had a greater sense of appreciation after spending the morning at Mile 3 North, where there are a lot of uh, homeless encampments and people who don't have those basic necessities. And then finally, I think, you know, I, I, I ended the day with a real um, affirmation and a real renewed sense of, of hope and uh, belief in the power of people coming together. You know, no agenda, uh, no financial gain, no other motives, except to work together to accomplish something good. 
Uh, and so that was very, very uh, precious to me. And I just want to thank everyone. I know I didn't have a chance to talk to everybody personally because, you know, once you saw those piles of trash, I just couldn't help myself and, and jumped in and start cleaning. Uh, I do have some photos taken by myself, by Alex Watson uh, and Shirley Short to share with you. So you have a sense for those who were not able to participate this time, a sense of, you know, the, the challenge that was out there on Mile 3 North. And Mr. Chairman, I apologize. We did not get a good picture. I normally take pictures of nature. So, you know, mm -hmm. event photography was new to me. So next time, this is practice for the next cleanup event. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to share these pictures with you. And once again, thank everybody. Um, and also for those who participated, if you have any suggestions for improvement, uh, please email them to me. I'm going to meet with Alex. And there were several things I recognized where I, I was, I'm going to offer some suggestions for improvement going forward on the cleanups. So if you have any, um, any thoughts, please go ahead and share with me or with Alex directly. Um, with that, Ms. Townsend, if you, I can ask you to do the slideshow. It's on automatic, so hopefully it'll just roll by itself. If not, Ms. Townsend, put you forward, like, you know, at a count of three. Yeah, I found this sign. Yep. Yeah, no. Thank you so much, Tam. You know, uh, folks may not know, but Tam actually organized uh, for the board to adopt mile three before the COVID um, uh, pandemic uh, hit us. And we're looking to begin to really have a, a water boards um, cleanup of the American River, adopt a, a mile and really get a little more connected to our water quality work. And it was an inspired and incredible thing. And just thank you, Tam. It, it was, um, I certainly felt it the next day as well and felt the fact that I hadn't had much uh, physical activity over the last year. So uh, just what I what I commit to is continue to do continue to do these cleanups and we will I'll continue to work with you Tam particularly for us to to just have a, a regular cleanup here one that our, our, our staff can volunteer and involve, get involved with. As you see this isn't a family friendly mile if you will this is um, hard work and cleanup but just thank you, Tim, uh, incredibly. And so good to see you again and look forward to continuing to work with you. Great, thank you all very much. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Uh, it, was, it was an incredible event, it really was. And so thank you again, board member Firestone for being able to join. I know everyone's uh, calendars are quite busy so there will be future opportunities for sure. So just thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to our next public commenter, uh, who's Laura Rosenberg Hader. I want to apologize, she may actually not be here on the platform because on the sc on the scroll, I'm only seeing uh, Becky Steinbrunner now. So, Chair Esquivel, that is correct. Um, so, we're going to go ahead and invite Ms. Steinbrunner to speak at this point. Okay, thank you. 
Hello, I have unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in Santa Cruz County and am bringing to you my concerns and that of many, many in Santa Cruz County, specifically the Mid-County area, regarding the SoCal Creek Water District's Pure Water SoCal project. Your agency has uh, funded that project with a $50 million grant and a $38 million low-cost loan. But I want to assure you that um, there is great public concern about this project, and I'm bringing to you specifically that there is no final anti-degradation analysis for this project. There was a draft analysis that was uh, referred to in the EIR that the board certified, the SoCal Creek Water District Lead Agency Board certified in December of 2018. But there has been no final anti-degradation report for this project that will inject 1.3 million gallons of recycled water into the pristine per Parisma aquifer every day when it is in operation. Not having a final anti-degradation report violates uh, State Water Resources Control Board Resolution 68-16 that was passed many years ago and has been upheld and updated with the purpose and goal of maintaining high quality waters such as the Parisma Aquifer. We in this community are very concerned about this, and we are also concerned that the district is not consulting with this, the California Department of Water Resources um, and not consulting with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, as is required by state law, to make sure that mitigations for this project will be developed and will be effective and will be enforceable. I have this information from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Just recently, they are completely unaware of this project. A lot of that is due to their, their staffing problems. But I want to make you aware of this because you are a funder of this project. And I want to make you aware that there is great public concern in the Mid-County area. And I, I beg you <laughs> to please contact SoCal Creek Water District and demand that they follow the law, Resolution 6816, and submit to you a final anti-degradation project. They are well aware that their processes, as, as high-tech as they are, will not be able to remove all of the pharmaceuticals and unregulated contaminants of emergence concern. They know this, and yet they are neglecting and ignoring the public's repeated outcry that this be addressed. We have no confidence in their ability or their willingness to address these issues. They are ignoring the public. So as their funder, I am begging you this morning to demand that they submit to you and to the public a final anti-degradation analysis that will thoroughly address the impacts and mitigations that they intend to force, actually, on all of the mid-county water users. There are many private wells nearby many water, small water mutuals that are nearby, the injection well at Twin Lakes Church, and they are not reaching out to those people. But those people are down flow of the injection well at Twin Lakes Church. There is no plan for them to use any of this recycled water for irrigation other than free water for the Twin Lakes Church for 50 years for only their athletic fields. When Cabrillo College sits just across the street with extensive 
athletic fields that they are irrigating with their private wells that could be affected by this this injection. So again, my final pleading is to demand, ask that you demand, SoCal Creek Water District to produce a final anti-degradation analysis and report that is publicly available and is in compliance with Resolution 68-16. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Steinbrunner. I appreciate your time this morning and flagging this for, for our staff and for us. Um, I know our, um, our chief deputies are here, our executive director as well, so um, I'll circle back with them. And so we appreciate the flag. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe that concludes our public forum. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, their time this morning. So next we can move on to our informational items. Our first item is item number two, which, or I apologize. I don't mean to, to skip item number one in my agenda. Um, let's move to item number one, which is consideration of the board meeting minutes uh, from the previous board meeting, uh, July 6th, 7th. Do I have any motions? Move adoption of the minutes. Thank you, Vice Chair. Second. Second. Thank you. Ms. Townsend, can you please call roll call vote? Yes. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Board Member Morgan? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. And Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. The vote carries and the board meeting minutes are adopted. And now we can get to our tranche of informational items. Our first is a drought update. And so I think we'd like to invite uh, Eric Ekdahl, and I know we're being uh, joined today by Ernest Conant and uh, Carla Namath. But uh, Mr. Ekdahl, do you want to start us off? Sure thing. Thank you, uh, Chair Escavella and members of the board. We have a few short slides on a drought update. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, presentation outline will give a quick highlight on some additional drought proclamations and executive orders that were issued on July 8th. Then we'll go into watershed specific drought efforts uh, with highlights on the Bay Delta watershed, Mill and Deer Creeks, Russian River, and the Scott and Shasta Rivers. Uh, we have representatives from the Department of Water Resources and United States Bureau of Reclamation that will speak kind of after the Bay Delta bullet. And then uh, We'll have a quick update on drinking water and other actions. Next slide, please. Uh, a quick update on an additional drought proclamation that occurred on July 8th. Uh, July 8th, another proclamation added nine counties to the existing proclamations that now cover uh, 50 of California's 58 counties. The counties that were aided, added on July 8th were Inyo, Marin, Mano, Monterey, San Luis Obispo, San Mateo, Santa Barbara, Santa Clara, and Santa Cruz. So essentially all of California north of the Tehachapis roughly are now covered by a drought proclamation. In a separate executive order, uh, the governor called on Californians to voluntarily reduce water use by 15% compared to 2020. And I believe you'll hear more about that at our uh, in, in information item number three, uh, touching on urban water conservation. Uh, next slide, and I think I'll turn it over to Diane Riddle, who will present on the Bay Delta slides. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and board members. Again, I'm Diane Riddle. I'm one of the assistant deputy directors in the Division of Water Rights overseeing the Bay Delta and hearings and special projects uh, branch. Um, I'll just provide a brief overview of some of our activities in the Bay Delta watershed, and then I will turn it over to representatives from the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation. In addition to the directors for those agencies, we also have staff that plan to provide an operational update. Um, first, we've provided some updates to you on the um, temporary urgency change petition that we previously received from the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation uh, to modify Delta outflow and salinity requirements um, in the Delta between June and mid-August. Um, as you're aware, we approved that temporary urgency change petition um, subject, subject to various conditions. Um, we've been in the process of working with the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation on 
meeting the requirements of those conditions um, and also addressing, we've had some exceedances of the requirements in the modified order as well as some other exceedances of decision 1641 requirements um, that we're evaluating along with some petitions for reconsideration of the temporary urgency change petition. We'll have further information for you on those activities in the near future. Um, we are also working with the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation to determine whether they will seek a, an additional temporary urgency change petition to modify Sacramento River flows during the September through November time period. Um, the Department and Bureau of Reclamation have been evaluating whether the, an additional temporary urgency change petition will be needed or not, um, and we may hear from them on that today. Next slide, please. Um, the other update that I wanted to provide for you is on um, the notices of water unavailability and possible development of emergency regulations. Um, as, I, as I think you're also aware, conditions have been very dry throughout much of the state and particularly in the Delta watershed where we've seen very high depletions from the system that have resulted in significant water supply shortages in reservoirs and concerns related to um, protection of salinity control, temperature management, and water supplies going into next year, as well as health and safety supplies in Folsom Reservoir and other areas. As a result of these concerns, the board issued notices of water unavailability to all post-1914 water right holders um, back in June. Um, at that time, we also sent notices to all, um, all other senior water right claimants, including pre-1914 appropriative claimants and riparian claimants, notifying those users that water may also be un unavailable under those rights in the near future. We've been working um, to evaluate those issues. We have found that water, it does look like water is unavailable for those users um, through the remainder of the water year, um, including uh, all of the most, all of the pre-1914 users on the San Joaquin River system, many of the pre-1914 users on the Sacramento River system down to, I think, the 1880s time period, as well as some water unavailability for riparian water right holders who, um, when there are shortages in their supplies, share those shortages in a correlative way. Um, so as a result of those severe water supply shortages, staff have also been working to develop um, emergency regulations pursuant to the authority that was granted to the board as part of the May um, emergency proclamation. We are planning to release draft emergency regulations addressing water unavailability issues in the, Bay Del in the Delta watershed this Friday. Um, it also includes some additional reporting requirements to help us to better evaluate water unavailability issues. At that time, we also intend to issue additional notices of water unavailability to the group of users that I identified previously. Um, we intend to have a workshop to discuss the um, possible emergency regulations, as well as updates to our methodology to evaluate um, water unavailability um, pursuant to, to be used in the emergency regulations on July 27th from 1 to 5 p.m. A notice for that will be forthcoming um, today. Um, then we would be the Staff is proposing that the board consider adoption of emergency regulations as early as August 3rd. Um, it's a very aggressive time schedule. I think you'll recognize um, given the very dry conditions we are proceeding with these activities, um, we are still very much interested in receiving public input, um, but also um, understanding the need to proceed with haste given very dry conditions. Um, next slide, please. I think um, actually we can turn it over now to uh, representatives from 
the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation. You could probably back up one slide, I'm sorry. Um, I, they don't have a PowerPoint presentation, um, but I think we can probably leave this slide up for their presentation. Thank you, Diane. Um, Ernest or um, Carla, Director Namath, uh, which one, which of you would like to go first? And thank Hi you there. for joining us this morning. Of course. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thank you, Chair Esquivel and uh, members of the board. Um, I think Ernest and I had some overarching comments and then um, more detailed information um, is coming from uh, Molly White and Kristen White, our, our operators of the system. So <clears throat> one, um, uh, a couple of, of observations. <clears throat> I think what we're really experiencing this year, um, we do have the temporary urgency change order from the board. Um, it has um, targets for carryover storage, but also um, you know, revised water quality um, conditions um, down in the Delta. And um, right now the projects are having a difficult time meeting both. Um, and it's not for lack of trying. Um, there's a lot of effort um, with new Malonis that I think you're aware of. Um, you know, relative to trying to manage the system. So this is a year that is um, extraordinary, uh, but it's also uh, very much a, a learning year where we are all, I think, um, dusting off our, our past practices and understanding what works about them and what doesn't work about them as we look towards the potential for a dry year next year. So one of the things that um, changed over the course of the last month plus, um, just to add to our mix of overall uncertainty in the system, um, while king tides themselves are, are predictable, we know when they're coming every year, um, but we also saw an, ex an exaggerated um, effect of them this year beyond um, what we had experienced in the past, that um, in addition to the increasing um, depletions and the uncertainty around those depletions, I think has been a driver for um, our ongoing challenges relative to reservoir levels, uh, where we are releasing, the water isn't um, making it to the Delta, and we have some um, much smaller uh, water quality violations, certainly than we would have had without the, the temporary urgency change order, but um, some days here and there nonetheless. So I state all of that, um, and that's you know one of the reasons why it's important to me to be here in front of the board articulating how we're trying to manage the system, um, the degree to which there's um, uncertainty around it, but also, um, you know, we have some very surgical problems, but our instrumentation is fairly is fairly blunt in terms of what we can do with the reservoirs. Um, so that's very much uh, part of the dialogue that um, we need to engage in with the board in this public setting. Um, we are continuing to um, uh, develop our drought operations plan. Um, we are looking at our transfer program to demonstrate um, some improvement um, in what our modeling is currently showing relative to carryover storage for the end of the year. We know that's very important um, to the board for um, species needs, but also as we move into next year, um, just sort of prudent planning to put ourselves in the best position um, possible. Uh, a couple of things that the department has done since then, um, one is uh, obviously following suit with the 15% um, voluntary conservation. We are in conversations with our state water contractors, largely urban contractors to, um, to implement that conservation and implement it immediately uh, given the um, concern or we're dry conditions next year. We've also been in touch with our um, lessees on our Delta owned islands um, about conservation this year. Um, I wanna thank um, Michael George um, for um, helping um, 
um, establish some ways in which we can interact more broadly with uh, Delta water users. DWR, of course, is a Delta water right holder and user. Um, and um, we look forward to over the course of the summer really merging those efforts so that we can all understand um, depletions in that part of the system and the things that we can be doing. Um, and then lastly, I would say um, we are still working on the potential for a second temporary urgency change a petition to the board. I, I want to acknowledge the board's desire to have as much public process around that as possible. So um, we understand that and we're going to move um, as we're managing through all the uncertainties of the system with kind of all deliberate speed to get it in front of the board in a way that will allow for that to happen. So um, uh, before I kick it over to Ernest, um, I just want to say I've got a, I've got a hard stop in about 10 minutes. So I won't probably be here for the Q&A, which is always the, the best part, um, but um, it's good to be here and I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Ernest. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Can you hear me okay? You can, thank you. And thank you, Great. Director. Yeah, and uh, uh, good morning, uh, Chair and uh, members. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, at the risk of being repetitive, I'll just say I uh, echo everything that Carla has said. Uh, our respective staffs and, and Carla and I are working closely together on these various issues that we're trying to deal with in this unusual year. Um, just to add a couple other things, um, again, we appreciate the efforts of the staff and board in trying to move forward the emergency regulations and the notice of unavailability of water as quickly as possible. I think that's very important. Um, and uh, I'm sure that DWR would join me in saying that we, you know, we want to support and assist the staff in any way we can in, in that effort. Uh, it's part of a, a longer conversation we need to have beyond just this year. Um, uh, but uh, it's the, your immediate actions on that are much appreciated. Um, and then also on the conservation message, again, we, we appreciate the efforts of the governor um, to come forth and of course your support uh, with the conservation message um, and the recent proclamation. Uh, we're also uh, trying to uh, amplify that message to our urban contractors in particular. Uh, you'll notice that recently last week, I think it was, uh, the Regional Water Authority uh, took action to uh, you know, promote at least 15%, if not 20. Um, and so uh, we're, we're, we're uh, grateful that our American River contractors are down that path and trying to amplify the conservation message, which is very important, not only for this year and, and the reservoir levels and so on, but also looking forward to next year if we have another dry year. So with that, um, I think we'll kick it over to Molly White and, and uh, Kristen White, White and White, to uh, provide a few more details. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I'll just uh, make note. A, I have a hard stop at 10, so I may miss part of the conversation also. That's fair. And, and thank you. And I'll just make a, a quick note that we do have just an incredible opportunity to get better telemetry, to get better data, to better understand this system, not just for modeling uh, out uh, you know, projected inflows, but really in managing better real time. And that the water rights system is overlaid, as you well know, on top of these projects that you manage. And that we have this joint responsibility across the watersheds to better inform our decisions here. And I think we have a real opportunity to invest. I know that the state budget has dollars here to invest both on the water rights data system side for the board, but also on telemetry and on being able to better measure the drops as they move through the watershed and understand how they interact with diverters, understand how they meet water quality standards and all the other activities that take place in this incredible watershed. So just thank you and just plus up those, uh, the ideas of really looking at the time ahead to figure out how we have a better system moving into next year, knowing that um, whether, whichever conditions we find ourselves with, it'll, it'll better serve us all for our decision-making here in the future. So just thank you for that. Thank you. If I might, um, I'm just, uh, I had a couple of, uh, uh, just a high level comment and wanted to take advantage of uh, Director Nemeth and uh, Conant's presence before, you know, they have to take off for the hard stop 
So just really want to thank you both um, and your agencies for the dialogue with our staff um, in better determining uh, curtailments and depletion issues um, and the methodology. And I'm, I'm just mindful, Ms. Nemeth, of the comment that you made last time about not having to get it just right. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, and along those lines, um, I think uh, many of us, if not all of us, are really um, encouraging our staff as they move forward with the development of the curtailment uh, package to be looking for opportunities for voluntary agreements or you know, other approaches instead of following uh, the requirements strictly. Um, but what comes to mind is just a concern about um, how those other approaches uh, could be evaluated by our staff um, and, and you all and your teams and just um, um, encouraging um, that as we put this together, if you all could help us structure some, some, something in such a way as to um, where we do have, um, where we do receive other approaches or potential voluntary agreements to have a structure that is, um, you know, maybe not um, uh, specifically um, stated on deadlines, but some way for us to evaluate things expeditiously so that voluntary agreements really uh, could have a potential instead of, you know, receiving them and then not quite knowing how to evaluate. And if we don't have a hard deadline, then the evaluation may not occur in time to take advantage of those um, other approaches. Um, thank you, um, Vice Chair Diadamo. Um, we will certainly do that. And um, I agree, our, our staffs have been um, working very intensely together. And I think the, you know, our, the way in which we can be most successful is um, ensuring that that continues and ensuring that the perfect isn't the enemy of the good, if you will, um, because we really want to bring, um, you know, I share in the board's desire to bring water rights holders along with us because it is important to the integrity of that system that um, we are, you know, open about um, how we're moving through that and the information that we do have that's that's leading to decisions. And um, if folks can come to a an agreement um, voluntarily, obviously those those local solutions are um, are 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 better solutions because they have the um, they have the buy-in at, at the real local level, and and we want to be implementing together with local leadership. So I I agree with um, all that you've stated, and I will talk to my my team and make sure that we are ready to help and thinking about um, what kind of structure we could uh, bring to the table to help the evaluations. Thank you. Same here, Vice Chair. Yeah, I think importantly, it's all the same data. It's all the same hydrologic data and drops. It's the same data on diverters and their rights. Uh, it's a continuum between uh, what the efforts here at the board are and those voluntary efforts out there. So the more those are transparent, synced up, can be, cap can be counted and uh, assurance is made that the water will be there, that we will, that it is a real agreement is important. And the difficulty becomes uh, in that uh, we don't have sometimes all the data we need within the watershed. So I think that focusing on that data and realizing that it's in common, both in the decision-making that this board does, but also the way locals might self-organize around voluntary agreements can help um, make sure we don't create false dichotomies between the work. Thank you, Vice Chair. And thank you, uh, Director and uh, Namath and, and uh, Regional Director Conan. Really appreciate your time this morning. I know there's a lot going on, so thanks. Thank you. And thank you, thank you. Ms. White and Ms. White, thank you. Thank you uh, for those uh, introduction comments, directors, and thank you very much to board members for having us here to provide a brief operational update. Um, I'll kick it off with an update of what's been going on and then I'll turn it over to Molly for what's coming up. So, um, so I, I think some of this has already been mentioned, but no harm in going over it again because this is a um, continues to be a record-breaking year. <laughs> Um, so depletions were drier in June than, than were estimated in May. Um, in fact, April, May, June, the, that three month period was the driest and warmest on record since 1896. So just adding to the tally of records that we're breaking this year with these very uh, poor and dry conditions. Um, 
As a result of those depletions uh, throughout the month of June and into July, both projects have had to increase releases from Shasta, Oroville, and New Maloney's to meet water quality standards, uh, as well as to be able to decrease uh, releases out of Folsom to protect public health and safety um, there in the event of a dry fall. Um, for most of June and part of July, we have, we have initiated a one facility operation in the Delta. Uh, this is maintaining a very basic minimum exports. Um, uh, this is something we hadn't done prior to this year, um, but it seems to be working in order to just give us a tiny bit more uh, flexibility in the Delta. Um, however, they were increased slightly on Friday of last week to move a very small portion of transfer water. Um, and I think uh, notifications of that were sent. Um, unfortunately, even with these, these increases in, uh, in releases and these, these minimal exports, as uh, Director Namath mentioned, we have still struggled to maintain our salinity uh, uh, compliance at both Western Ag um, uh, compliance locations and had notified the board in late June and in early July of exceedances that we saw in, uh, um, in early July. Um, both with the temporary urgency change order and standards in D1641. Um, we are back in compliance now, um, I think as of uh, Thursday of last week. Um, and I, I think we've mentioned this at previous meetings, but uh, this is a year that we're really struggling to balance between Delta conditions and maintaining upstream storage for um, both for conditions this year and for going into next year, should next year be dry. So we do intend to have very little flexibility within the system uh, for meeting Delta standards and will likely be operating very close to the standard for the remainder of the summer. So I think that's a brief update of where we're at and I'll turn it over to Molly for, uh, for what's coming up. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good morning, Chair Esquivel, uh, Vice Chair Diadamo and board members. Um, again, looking, I'll just projecting out, looking at the next couple of weeks, uh, we do expect to see a decreasing trend in depletions as we march between now and the end of the month. Um, one of our main objectives is to look at the first opportunity that we can uh, reduce upstream releases, um, essentially really primarily looking at uh, Lake Oroville and Shasta. Uh, Director Namath had um, touched on this, but back in June, we did put a pause on our um, submittal of the drought contingency plan, um, just considering the conditions that Kristen um, walked through with the drier conditions and depletions and so forth and how those were um, affecting the projected fall storage uh, targets for the upstream reservoirs. So we have been coordinating with stakeholders just on the current drought actions and then assessing their protection, their potential um, impact on fall storages. Um, as far as technical support, we have been in communication with board staff on technical support to um, for the uh, methodology, the curtailment methodology, and we're actually um, both representatives from both Reclamation and DWR are meeting this week to further discuss next steps and so forth. So um, that is an ongoing process. And then Again, just to follow up on the um, second TUCP, again, we, um, we're we working with the Bureau and assessing and just, um, again, very much recognize the board's um, timeline and so forth, just that um, you all can go, um, that you have enough lead time as far as for your public process. And with that, that is um, all I had to add and I'll, we will open up to questions. Thank you. I really appreciate. I know things are, it's a difficult year and we're trying our best to, to manage through and that it's a large system, certainly again, the Bay Delta encompassing 40% as we know of the state mm -hmm. and a lot of activities going on, including our, our proposed curtailment work. And so being able to continue to manage and understand how our actions are all contributing to really huge and important goals, like ensuring that we are keeping mm -hmm our reservoir storage targets here, knowing that we have to anticipate a dry year next year. And there are huge consequences to our fisheries this year. And um, the balancing that this board is called to do, particularly in circumstances like this, um, are not easy. And But it is a joint uh, responsibility, I feel strongly. And I know uh, the operators here, the projects, 
so should should do so as well. That um, we're all we're all managing this system jointly, and need to be able to continue to communicate and cooperate with one another's processes so that we get to these big outcomes, like being able to keep enough uh, water in our, our reservoirs and storage to buffer what is going to be either way a very difficult year next year if things remain dry. And so just appreciate that and appreciate the uh, work and, and feedback on the methodology. Again, this is all the same watershed. These are the same, uh, you know, when it comes to government's response here, um, it, it really requires us to have difficult but continued engagement and discussion around how we're managing this system collectively. And so I just appreciate that commitment to this work and continuing to, to update us on what you're seeing in the system as we all do our parts to, to manage through uh, very difficult circumstances here. So just thank you. Board members, any questions or, or comments? I have a question. Yeah, by all means, Board Member Firestone. Um, great, so thanks and um, yeah, incredibly challenging year. Um, so appreciate all of the work you all are doing to try to manage through it. Um, um, I am curious, um, we, you know, in the um, uh, temporary, um, sorry, the temperature management plan <laughs> that we um, that we approved. Uh, one of the many requirements there was to um, submit a report of um, evaluation of proposals that had been submitted by stakeholders. Um, and I know you all are, you know, doing everything you can <laughs> to manage through operations, and you know best. Um, I'll, you know, how to do that. And I'm curious if you, how that's going and if you've been able to do that yet, I think particularly looking to, you know, to next year um, and thinking about how to prepare for that. Cause I know we're at this point um, far in this year. Sure, uh, so I, I can, uh, thanks for that question. And I can address um, the, the initial um, requirement. It was a very short turnaround time. I want to say it was due like June, 10th or something like that, uh, or maybe short, shortly after. Um, uh, we had only received one stakeholder proposal uh, that, that had come to us, and we did uh, include a response to that, sent back to uh, the board. Um, I can't remember if it was the day before the deadline or on the deadline, sorry. <laughs> But we did include that and evaluated some of the some of the ideas mostly had to do with interactions of uh, Trinity and Whiskey Town. Um, okay. We do remain open to hearing ideas. Um, in fact, we are evaluating a, an action of uh, an early drawdown at Whiskey Town. Um, we've got a public uh, um, NEPA document that will be coming out uh, in the next uh, couple days for uh, for public comment as a, a potential solution. Um, although it's um, um, it, it's certainly not without its drawbacks. So that's one of the options that we're uh, that we're looking into and considering. And we continue to be open and, and working with stakeholders in our um, our numerous meetings. We meet weekly with um, the Sacramento River Temperature Task Group and uh, continue to evaluate ideas and discuss alternatives. So um, love to hear it if uh, if there are more more ideas that we can discuss. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, I'm not positive all the requirements, but I, I think I um, appreciate, you know, that, uh, you know, ensuring that we can have as many ideas on the table to be able to evaluate options since this is, um, you know, I think new territory in terms of how we're going to manage through this and, you know, what, what happens next year and years forward. So appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, board member. Um, you know, we're we're literally living through a laboratory right now. These are unprecedented uh, circumstances and conditions that uh, we're all needing to work through. And and to your point, have to be open to all thoughts and ideas, and but also have to act in in many of these spaces. So it's it's that balance of being able to make sure we're we are open and considering and incorporating the best of the ideas that are out there right now, because. Uh, we are in such unprecedented uh, circumstance here that we need we need everyone's collective uh, thoughts and energy here, uh, contributing to what can be solutions. It's a it's a huge state, and there's 
a lot of a specific challenge within watersheds here. So just thank you, board member. Other other colleagues, uh, questions or thoughts? Okay, hearing none, thank you. I really appreciate everyone's time today on this item. Uh, well, we're not done with the item on, on the Bay Delta portion of the discussion. And now we can uh, move on to uh, other watersheds that we're working on here um, and kick it back over to uh, Diane and Eric. Great, and if we can get the, the PowerPoint back, back up, I think uh, Diane will cover this slide and then I'll jump back in after this one. Sounds good. So I'm um, still in the Bay Delta watershed, but a, a corner of the Bay Delta watershed um, that is very important for native uh, anadromous fish species, including spring run and steelhead. That includes mill and deer creeks. As you may recall, in the prior drought, the board adopted emergency regulations to provide minimum in-stream flows and mill deer and antelope creeks due to their um, critical importance as habitat for these native fish species and the very imperiled position that they're in during these extreme dry years. This year is looking just as dry as the conditions that we saw in 2014 and 2015. Um, so board staff in coordination with the fishery agencies, Department of Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries Service have been um, in discussions with water users um, on Mill and Deer Creeks, Antelope Creek. There are um, other regulatory requirements in place that I think um, we believe are going to meet minimum in-stream flows for the protection of those fish species. So our, our efforts have really been focused on Mill and Deer Creeks. We've had um, some meetings with the water users on Mill and Deer Creeks to explore possible voluntary measures that the water users may be able to take in order to provide protective conditions for fish species on those creeks. We've had a couple of letters back and forth, as have the fishery agencies, um, and we've been in discussions uh, trying to determine if we can reach some voluntary solutions in order to provide those protections. Um, in the event that we're not able to do that, staff is developing um, and evaluating the need for emergency regulations. Um, we're starting discussions with board members this week. Um, and again, uh, because we would be in a position of needing in-stream flows in the in the early fall time period, we are looking at possibly considering um, emergency regulations for minimum belly scraping flows on Mill and Deer Creeks, um, similar to what we considered during 2014 and 2015 as early as mid-August. So that's the update for Mill and Deer Creeks. I can um, take questions or we can turn it over to Eric to complete the update and take questions at the end, whatever you prefer. I think we can save questions for the end. Okay, great. Next slide, please. A couple more watersheds to update. Uh, the Russian River, the regulation approved, uh, was approved by the Office of Admin Administrative Law or OAL and is in effect. It was approved by the Secretary of State on July 12th. Uh, right now, Lake Mendocino storage levels are currently above the thresholds that would trigger the curtailment orders. However, based on data from Sonoma County Water Agency and kind of looking at depletions and historical depletions in the upper Russian River watershed, we do anticipate that Lake Mendocino will fall below this storage target on or around August 1st, and staff are preparing to respond with curtailment orders as appropriate and as necessary once that uh, storage target is kind of exceeded or underseeded, if that's a word. Uh, the supply and demand analysis for the lower Russian River is underway and we do also anticipate that this will be completed by the end of July. Uh, next slide, please. The Scott and Shasta rivers, a quick update there. We did receive emergency belly scraping flow recommendations from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife on June 15th. Uh, staff have been taking a look at those and have been drafting emergency uh, it, cur curtailment regulations or in-stream fl flow regulations. We released those for public comment on July 16th. And note that we have a public meeting later today 
at 3 p.m. and that the comment period closes for this public draft on July 23rd at 5 p.m. Uh, note that we will likely have a second round of public comment on these draft regulations. This is kind of an early effort to solicit stakeholder input and to kind of craft and come up with regulations that we think are viable and will produce a, a good and practical outcome. Uh, and although it is still early, we anticipate taking these towards the, the board for their consideration, for your consideration in the middle of August, potentially at the August 17th board meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, just one other quick update. We have proceeded ahead with notices of violation for a number of diverters that have not yet complied with SB 88. For a bit of background, SB 88 is the measurement and reporting uh, requirements. They've been in place since 2016. Uh, and the uh, Division of Water Rights Enforcement Section sent out early warning letters in early June, kind of notifying these same set of diverters that they had not yet either reported that they had a measurement device in place and had not submitted data to the board. Uh, if they did not respond within a set number of days, I believe it was 45 days, uh, the division went ahead with issuing a formal notice of violation. We sent out about 200 plus in the Scott, Shasta, Navarro and Russian River on July 19th. And again, these are focused on larger diverters that generally divert more than 1000 acre feet per year uh, and that have not reported that they have a measurement device in place and have not provided any data. It's a relatively smaller subset of the total number of divers in the watershed, but these are the major diverters that ostensibly are using the most water and the data from which is the most important in terms of crafting uh, you know, curtailment efforts and notices of water unavailability and really evaluating supply demand conditions in that watershed. Uh, because there's a lot going on in the Bay Delta watershed, we're holding off there for another week or two but we do anticipate sending those notices out to Bay Delta watershed diverters that divert more than 5,000 acre feet per year in the Bay Delta watershed in the next one to two weeks. Uh, approximately 500 right holders in total covering 700 unique rights. And as a reminder, we have a list of all the non-compliant right holders available on our website. Next slide, please. A few additional reminders and updates. We have the drought webpage, which contains a lot of useful information on board-wide drought activities. And we encourage everybody uh, to sign up for the various email subscription lists, which is how we communicate with most of the diverters and stakeholders in the various watersheds highlighted today. And I think with that, next slide, we'll turn it over to Darren Polhemis for any drinking water updates. Morning, Chair Esquivel and Board. This is Darren Paul Hemis. <clears throat> I'm Deputy Director for the Division of Drinking Water. Uh, I started off with just a couple things to tell you, but then uh, that list grew on me substantially. So apologize for taking a few minutes here. Um, first, I oh, want to apologies in the least. <laughs> first, I want to report that um, the community of Hornbrook uh, had suffered a water outage. There's been response to that. We want to thank Siskiyou County for jumping in <clears throat> with their emergency operations system and uh, making sure the residents got water right away. Uh, there's a lot of investigation going on uh, there to try to find a, a more intermediate and long-term solution. Um, I think an interesting note about this community was they had three wells and a surface water. So you often hear me rail against communities that have a single source uh, that suffer a drought uh, outage and the um, it, potentiality of that. Uh, the system obviously had multiple sources uh, that have now suffered severely during the drought. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, because I didn't know, Hornbrook is uh, located on I-5, almost at the Oregon border up in the very Northern California, not too far from the Klamath River as it flows through there. So uh, kind of an interesting development there. Um, action is being taken place. I have some early reports on the other end of the state of uh, uh, the community of needles being down to one well. We're 
just in the very beginning phases of trying to investigate that and what's happened there. So um, more will follow as we uh, uncover what's going there. Uh, kind of moving to some regional reports, I wanted to uh, report on uh, the Lake County and Clear Lake area. Uh, we have reports that many of the water systems that withdraw from the lake as it lowers are uh, finding it hard to produce enough water for their water systems due to algae intake into their treatment systems. Uh, this was one of the things we predicted may happen and is seem, seeming to accelerate now that we're into summer and the lake levels are lowering and the temperatures are up. So uh, we'll be more keeping an eye on that. That could uh, continue to be a problem for that region as that develops uh, through the summer. Uh, also in Mendocino County, uh, we've uh, mentioned many times before the Fort Bragg situation and the work we're doing there to develop them. And I think I also mentioned that Fort Bragg is a water hauler for much of that coastal area and the small water systems up and down the coast, including the town of Mendocino. Uh, Fort Bragg is now at a point where they're going to need to reduce and limit their ability to sell water to water haulers. And uh, this will be uh, pretty traumatic for a lot of the small water systems there. We are working to see if there are ways to address the different water hauling scenarios, but it gets really complicated really fast. And um, there's a lot of small water systems that uh, we're even discovering now that should have been logged as water systems, but were not registered. And so it's a uh, unveiling kind of an unfolding situation there that uh, could quickly get out of hand in Mendocino County and Mendocino County uh, we'll need to step up and uh, definitely take action to try to address much of that what's going on there. So more difficulties to come in that region as that progresses. Uh, I did want to point out that, um, <clears throat> as you know, we've uh, issued orders for data and that data should be starting to come in and we will work towards putting some of that together and reporting that out for general information as that comes along and it's new this year. So uh, we'll see how that progresses and uh, adjust as we go along here. Um, to that Mr. End, Pohemis, yes. oh, sorry, you may you may transition to this, but I was just going to ask if you're going to be issuing any new ones or anticipated any new ones. Yeah, uh, we we are investigating the issuance of new ones at this point. Um, there are some that are kind of in the queue that we're contemplating doing uh, as we develop. So there will be some additional ones added as we go along. I believe we've issued close to over a little over seventy now. The we keep adding them on as we. Uh, find them and 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 uh, need to find that we need to collect data from them to move forward. So more to come on that. Um, I do I did want to announce that um, I you know uh, we did get drop uh, response positions from the governor's budget and uh, I've actually completed one of our first hires in that uh, someone you'll probably start to see as I step away myself to deal more with the arrearages program. Um, Eric Zuniga, who is a district engineer from our San Bernardino district office. Uh, is uh, coming forward to uh, help coordinate drought activities and be a drought manage program manager for the Division of Drinking Water and uh, take over a big role of trying to pull together our data and, and help us with reporting and, and whatnot. So much needed uh, uh, help coming there to try to do that. So at some point uh, I may transition where Eric can give you the, the updates and um, be uh, presenting. So that's uh, the good news for, for us and some additional help coming along that lines. But I did want to end uh, quickly with the fact that the division is now seeing fire response activities that we're having to do um, on top of the drought activities and now taking on the arrearages program that we will be severely depleted in our ability to respond to a lot of activities throughout the state. Uh, we will, of course, triage and do the best we can, but um, the unprecedented scale of diverting activities here uh, does make me a little worried about the fact that we will not be able to accomplish a lot of our core mission of sanitary surveys and other things as we divert through the probably the remaining of this calendar year for these activities. So um, bear with us and certainly we uh, do take notice that that's an important task to get back to, but uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff now piling up and uh, very important tasks, of course, all of those that we uh, do, do want to do, but it will be uh, taxing uh, on staff and division as we move forward. So. That completes my quick report. Any questions I'm happy to take. Just thank you. I know, again, in the last drought, the Division of Drinking Water was just transitioning to the State Water Board. So, you know, this is the first time we've had the real benefit of our district engineers, a little more seated here at the board as we try to comprehensively respond to the drought and uh, point taken about the diversion of resources right now that it's taking to uh, track and and make sure to respond and appreciate and I know you know the communities particularly here 
the eye of the state and helping support uh, local response, knowing that uh, an emergency response, whether it's wildfires or earthquakes or others, it's the locals that we empower to quickly respond best. And uh, the state is here to make sure folks don't fall through the cracks. And here importantly with drinking water, that we have an eye toward longer term solutions um, with our safer program, with our, our, our drinking water generally, um, we know now is a time when our attention does turn to many systems, maybe sometimes for the first time, given the over 3000 systems we regulate here in the state. Um, and as we touch them, if you will, uh, being able to understand and ensure that we have the resources here at the state level for those longer term solutions. And here I'm thinking about the 1.3 billion that uh, we were also able to secure in the budget uh, for drinking water systems and wastewater systems is, is going to be important. It's a, you know, it's a continuum of effort here. I want to thank Cal OES the counties and also DWR and, and their continued work with us to uh, respond to changing circumstances here. And as we continue to hear, um, they, they can, the, the challenges continue to grow, they will, we know, because we're still here in the middle of summer and the drier parts uh, still ahead of us. So just thank you, Darren, um, yeah. incredibly for, I know the work that you and your district engineers are doing to help uh, in the state's response here. Yeah, thank you. And I, I'll just repeat basically what you said, but it's very important that the uh, local systems work up through their local emergency response um, so that the whole team can come to bear between <clears throat> the county environmental, or excuse me, <laughs> office, emergency offices, the Cal OES, Department of Water Resources, and ourselves so that uh, we're not, not any of us aren't stretched too thin and we can apply the best resources where we have it. So um, starting the emergencies local through the SIM system that is the system in California will be critical as we get into more and more of these popping up. So appreciate that. Thank you, Darren. Uh, any board members with questions or, or comments here? Yeah, I have a question um, and this is probably both for Eric and Darren um, and maybe John, <laughs> but um, I, so I guess, you know, these sorts of really extreme water shortages um, are just calling for really extreme action. And, um, you know, we're talking about curtailments, um, emergency regulations, we're having to do, do these um, incredible, you know, emergency operations with water systems, um, like you said. So I'm wondering, as we do, um, you know, especially as we're doing curtailments where we are seeing that um, uh, there are exceptions for public health and safety, if we're also then putting any requirements on water systems that are within that those exceptions to do conservation. I, I know that the information orders are um, asking for what they're doing. <laughs> And then certainly I think, um, you know, the expectation is that that people would conserve and maybe the local water agencies would put their own requirements on. Um, but this seems like an area where um, everyone needs to do their part. Everyone's hurting anything we can do to um, to preserve the little water supply we have is really important. So I'm just wondering how we're dealing with those sorts of um, potential requirements or resp clear responsibilities um, on especially those that we're making exceptions for within the curtailment process. So maybe that's Eric and Darren, I'm not sure. I, I can jump in uh, to start uh, and we can you know, point to what we did in the Russian River emergency regulations where we do have requirements that uh, maybe don't fully go as far as saying you must conserve, but basically limit the diversions to 55 gallons per person per day. And then there is a pathway for communities or public water systems to you know, say that they, they need a little bit more than that, but they have to go through a pretty rigorous demonstration of what that need is and, and why it needs to exceed 55 gallons per person per day. Uh, you know, we, we haven't yet gotten to the Bay Delta or the Shasta emergency regulations, but in concept, I believe that we'd approach pretty similarly. With that, I'll turn it over to Darren. Yeah, I can say that each instance where we know there's uh, pending or current issues, we about we've evaluated each of those water systems to see what steps they were taking, had conversations with them about it. Um, pretty much in each instance, they've all been taking the proper steps and we didn't feel that we needed to issue 
an order at this point. We're obviously going to continue to monitor that to see if there's something we need to do about that. And if we felt someone was being a little bit reckless or not taking the proper care, then we would follow up with what we believe are our authorities to issue an order in that instance. Um, so it's certainly certainly evaluated each time and we're continuing to do it. I think there is a bigger policy question that troubles me in the back of my mind as obviously we're dealing, we're, we're, the lens we're using now is the immediate drought circumstance. There is a much broader policy question of the adequacy of that water long-term and those different sources and what that means under our regulations in the guise of, is it an adequate water supply to meet daily demand? And certainly in the instance of the drought uh, here and its level, that is not the case. Um, but what's the measure by which we wanna judge them long-term? And of course that would be something that's gonna be coming up and I don't have an answer or uh, you know, I don't think any of us have an answer at the moment, but it is certainly troubling and um, something that we need to start thinking about as we progress through the year. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. Um, I mean, this really is the ultimate stress test, I think, on water systems. And so, like you said, I know with urban water management plans, they have to be doing a lot more evaluation of um, water supply adequacy um, for these kinds of uh, drought uh, conditions, but I know for the smaller systems that aren't doing urban water management plans, that's been a gap. So, um, Correct. yeah, um, okay, this is helpful. I guess I'm just wondering, you know, last time when the, um, in the last drought, when it got to the point where the governor um, issued mandatory cons uh, uh, conservation, um, or I guess we did, but <laughs> um, that there was, um, that part of that was doing a lot of messaging. And um, so I'm wondering, I know the governor had, you know, the 15% voluntary reduction. Um, and, you know, like you said, the, the, where we're having to do curtailments, we um, our messaging around the limits of 55 per person per day and as the requirements. I'm wondering if we're able to, you know, have we looked at doing more um, communication with those water agencies in these areas, um, urban water agencies, especially the, the small ones um, that, uh, you know, those targets and, um, you know, what they could be doing or what, what would be best practices, that kind of thing at this point. I think there'll be more um, ability to do some of that as we start to get our data in on production numbers. That's one of the questions we have and we'll be able to do some better calculations as to kind of what their current per capita consumption is and, and get that. You know, we have that for the large systems that do report, but we don't have it for the small ones. And so that will be up and coming. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I know we, it's like everyone, especially in these areas where, which is now most of the state um, are just, as the governor said, just doing, doing everything we can on this. Um, so my other question is really around uh, this, um, you know, real challenge around algal blooms and algae that we have now with the heat and the water, um, uh, shortage, uh, you know, you mentioned in Clear Lake, which I know, you, as you said, we've been concerned about for a while. Um, um, is there a, a, you know, it's not something that you can um, reverse <laughs> overnight. Um, so this is more probably looking for, for, you know, looking into next year or others, but are there ways that, um, you know, our water quality side and Division of Drinking Water are looking at maybe what we can do to both prevent and maybe treat um, when we're starting to get into the, the algal blooms and algae in general that may impact water supplies or drinking water supplies in particular. Yeah, generally the response is more to move the outfall to deeper water if that's a possibility. Unfortunately, Clear Lake is shallow um, and that doesn't often present itself. So getting a higher quality water to put through, um, you know, there could be other measures taken to try to enhance the treatment. What they end up doing is clogging their filters and having to backwash more frequently and that disrupts how much water they can produce through their facilities. Um, so there are some things to do. I, 
would not venture to say short term there's treatment uh, that can be done to a lake the size of Clear Lake or anything like that. That's much more long term and controlling water quality flow into it and things like that. And those programs are been underway and discussed for some time and will take some time to take effect. Uh, right. Certainly it does prompt that we need to continue in that. I do have a worry about you know some of our larger reservoirs we may not have seen this problem on as they get lower and shallower um, could pop up where we least expect it. So there's some concern about that as well. Yeah. And I know, um, you know, there's folks from Division of Drinking Water that are working on with the, the harmful algal bloom teams on um, this issue. So, but it does seem like, you know, thinking about how we're prioritizing and trying to accelerate some of those activities with with those sources that are um, drinking water sources directly is. Yeah. Um, there's just even more urgency around it. So, um, great. Okay. okay. And just to clarify too, the you know, the algae we're talking about here is you know not emitting harmful toxins at this point. It's yeah. algae, general algae that's clogging the facilities. Uh, but harmful is around the corner potentially, and a, a, a major concern. And that would be a whole other issue to to address. Um, but related yeah. for sure. Yeah, and that's more in in different areas. But yeah, I appreciate that. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Yeah, I know with the algae challenge, it's a matter of inputs, right? And um, it, do we know what a lot of the input into Clear Lake is when it comes to nutrient loading? Is there uh, septic uh, challenges there in the community, Darren? Um, I don't believe that's largely the case. There, most of the communities around there are sewer. There's certainly you know, potential for sewer leaks. I believe it's more uh, sediment and some ag runoff scenarios that are um, more involved. And, one of the really complicating factors, and I'm way out of my um, expertise level here, but I do know that you know once you load a body of water like that with nutrients, they cycle in continuously in it, and it's difficult to remove them. So it's not just cutting off the sources, and now it's some time for those um, you know to biologically make their way out. So it's a nutrient contamination is a very complex scenario. Certainly, stormwater runoff from those communities would likely be a, you know another potential source. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. And uh, just, yeah. Any other board members? Questions? I have a, I have oh, a question sure. for Mr. Ekdahl. Um, so uh, looking at your slides on the Russian, um, and I'm always curious about what motivates uh, people. So kind of comparing it to when the, when the notice of water unavailability went out in the Delta and that we didn't really see much of a reaction. Um, but with the reg, um, uh, over on the Russian, did the did the chart um, play out as expected? Uh, pretty much, yeah. The depletion rates have uh, largely kind of trended along what was projected. It's maybe doing a little bit better. Uh, some of the data that is coming in, they're able actually to show depletions in certain segments of the river. And so, you know, some are actually doing better, but then one in particular is maybe doing a little bit worse. And it, it's it's hard to say though whether that's because of a, a lack of, say, community engagement. My sense is that the community in the Upper Russian River has been extremely engaged, and that people are really going above and beyond uh, in terms of conservation, trying to save water, but that just drought conditions are so significant it's, it's been so warm so hot that there's just more depletions than uh that conservation can kind of make up for in terms of keeping it above that threshold target uh there probably are some ongoing diversions you know the the response to the notice of water unavailability we sent to about 900 right holders back in may and it did have a an admittedly voluntary questionnaire that asked folks to respond and of those 900, I think we've had less than 200 responses. So there, there is some, I think, lack of en engagement there, but from a, a kind of broader community sense, there's been an immense effort and a pretty good job at, at trying to do what people can. Thank you. Um, I have a question, you know, I've been listening to the conversation here and appreciate all the good work that everyone's doing. and all the divisions, frankly, here to address these problems as they're unraveling. And, um, you know, I'm hearing about these communities that are being impacted 
uh, like the Hornbrook and and this will probably miss bad needles. That was a new one uh, that I wasn't aware of that situation. So I'll be looking forward to hearing more about that. But um, and, and just thinking about the tools, so conservation, of course, being one tool. And it seems like during the last drought, another tool that was used were uh, also connection moratoriums. And so I was wondering if you could just speak to um, whether um, uh, DDW is starting to consider that. Is that something you've used? Um, or, or where does that sit within the realm of tools in the toolbox at this point? Yeah, no, that's part of our tool set. We have not issued any just yet. It would be, again, part of our conversation with a water system and understanding kind of where they're at. Um, you know, are they adding connections? And most of the point at this time, we have you know, none of them are, they are taking full drought actions and limiting their water use and usually have conservation underway. So the curtailment of the moratorium at this point wouldn't uh, yield any uh, additional savings from them at the moment. <clears throat> I think there is some question going forward in the long term, kind of hinting back to my policy level question of, you know, would that be something to be prudent to put in place um, at some point? Uh, as we hopefully come out of a drought to be clear that they need to address water sources and um, not end up in this situation again. So I, I'm kind of thinking of it possibly in that frame um, where it is something a little bit later, but as far as addressing an emergency at this point, it, it hasn't <clears throat> shown to be a useful tool. So we haven't implemented it just yet, but certainly we will, are not hesitant to do that if we think it would be. Okay, well, thank you. You know, I think I'll, I agree with you that these are long, longer term problems, but also that droughts come in bunches. We're already in the second year here, clearly. And I think we're all trying to be pragmatic and just anticipate that next year is going to be dry as well um, and see where that takes us. So I'll, I'll look forward to continuing that conversation with you, um, you know, about when to you know, pull the trigger on some of those actions. So thanks. Yes, definitely. I just say on that, sorry, I can't help myself, but just on, on that point with um, connections, I, I guess I'll just say, you know, my, obviously we're in a housing crisis in California. And so that's always something we're having to, to be mindful of. And so, um, you know, I think for me, the thinking about how are we improving overall water use efficiency um, demand from the system is probably, more important than um, you know the the housing connections because as we can move to more affordable housing options, we want to really encourage to do that, and and that may mean um, more connections and multifamily housing changes and that sort of thing. So I, I know that's something we're constantly having to balance. Yeah, absolutely, and that's part of the equation as monitoring where we're at. A lot of communities have done their growth on conservation that they've been able to achieve um, and, and see that they're even at a lower water usage than they might have been uh, previous to the previous drought. So um, those are definitely factors to con contemplate as we move ahead. And it would be part of the equation, as you mentioned. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, board members. Uh, any other questions, comments? Okay, hearing none. Thank you. I think we are now done with item number two, our drought update, and uh, appreciate everyone's uh, time and uh, particularly our, our sister agency partners on the federal and state side. So next, we will now go actually to further discussion here on drought, uh, but now uh, with a focus on conservation. So we'll move to item number three, which is uh, our update on monthly water production and conservation data reported by urban retail water suppliers. And so just a reminder, this is uh, data that, uh, we may, that we first began collecting in the last drought in emergency fashion then made into permanent uh, monthly reporting by our largest uh, urban water agencies here. And so I invite up uh, Marielle Pinheiro, I think to, to be our, um, our lead on this item. All right, thank you very much, um, Chair Esquivel. Um, good morning. Chair and members of the board, um, my name is Marielle Pinheiro, and I'm a research data specialist with the Office of Research, Planning, and Performance. And today I'll be providing the urban water conservation update for um, the May 2021 data set. Next slide, please. So um, 
obviously the last presentation provided a much better um, <laughs> uh, presentation of the facts than what I'm showing here, but um, in the context of what we're seeing with the data, it is really important to just keep in mind the drought um, and you know just the record-breaking temperatures that we're seeing across the Western United States. So um, Governor Newsom on July 8th, he added nine counties to the regional drought state of emergency and called on Californians to reduce their use by 15% with simple measures to protect water reserves and to help maintain critical flows for fish and wildlife whenever possible. Um, so according to the US drought monitor, 52% of, per of the state is in extreme drought and 33% of the state is in exceptional drought. Water levels in many of the state's reservoirs continue to fall. Oroville is at 37% of its average storage capacity. Shasta is at 47%. Here in the greater Sacramento area, Folsom is at 35%. With this in mind, we encourage our fellow Californians to remember that to help weather this drought, we must all do our part to conserve water. Um, next slide, please. So this chart illustrates monthly municipal per capita use. Um, there is both unconstrained demand as seen in the purple bars representing 2020 and the orange bars representing the first few months of 2021 as collected in our data sets. And the uh, manda mandatory conservation um, during the last drought as shown by the blue bars, which represents 2015 to 2016. Now note that January through May represents 2016 data while June through December represents 2015 data since the mandatory conservation went into place mid-year during the last drought. So we can see that the timing of the governor's call to voluntary reduce water use by 15% is good because summer months are peak water using months and there are many opportunities to conserve. Um, this is very clear when you can compare July 2020 to July 2015 water use. Uh, back in 2015, Californians then responded mightily to Governor Brown's um, call to save water. Next slide, please. So during the last drought, Californians stepped up in big and small ways, and we got extremely close to the target 25% reduction from the 2013 baseline. This chart shows 2020 production as a cumulative sum from July to June. So the first half is kind of swapped with the second half. Um, and the orange dashed line shows what a 15% reduction from that baseline would look like. We can see that this reduction would track very closely with the blue line, which represents 2015 to 2016 cumulative total production from July to June. 15% voluntary reduction by urban water users from 2020 levels could save as much as 850,000 acre feet of water over the next year for future use or enough to supply more than 1.7 million households for a year. Next slide, please. Well, what might reduce reducing water use by 15% look like inside an average home? Well, average 2020 residential summer use is about 120 GPCD. So if every Californian were to reduce their use by 15 GPCD, which is very convenient, um, we'd be well on our way to meeting the 15% reduction target. So the Save Our Water website um, provides some great tips on how Californians can save water indoors and out. Next slide, please. Before jumping into the numbers, we just wanted to take a minute to share some simple steps we can all take to help weather the drought. Our team really wants to reiterate that we can all do our part to save water. So for outdoors, one way to reduce outdoor water use is by adding mulch to your garden. Placing mulch around shrubs and garden plants can help reduce evaporation, inhibit weed growth, moderate soil temperature, and prevent erosion. Mulch allows soil to retain water, which means you need to water less frequently. Mulching can reduce outdoor water use by up to 20%. Next slide, please. Inside our homes, there are lots of water saving opportunities too. Showering is one of the leading ways that we use water in our home, accounting for about 20% of residential indoor use. For the average family, that adds up to nearly 40 gallons per day. The average family could save 
2,700 gallons of water per year by installing high efficiency, high efficiency shower heads. Since these water savings will reduce demand on water heaters, they will also save energy. The average family could save more than 330 kilowatt hours of electricity annually or the amount it takes to powerhouse for 11 days. Next slide, please. So while it would be nice to have real-time data available, the reality is it's just not feasible. So we won't be seeing the effects of um, the July 8th executive order just yet. July data is due on August 28th and will, prevent, will be presented at the September board meeting on um, September 21st. Next slide, please. I would like to take a moment to emphasize that we really do need this data more than ever, but we've seen a downtick in report completion these past couple of months. Um, when I pulled the data, there were 368 reports or just shy of 90% for the May 2021 data. Most reporters are only behind by one month, so I'd like to remind our reporters that the preliminary report option is available for those without final billing data. Next slide, please. May is pretty much the end of the time when we could conceivably replenish our water supply with more rain, and this year continues to exceed previous year's total production with the exception of 2013, um, with an estimated 176 billion gallons total production in May. Next slide, please. What we do know from our data is that many of the changes made in response to the last drought have um, been pretty permanent. Californians have maintained water savings relative to 2013, even in drier conditions. However, historically low winter and spring precipitation has resulted in the highest May numbers since reporting began. Although we're not going to see the effects of local or statewide conservation orders in the numbers for a couple more months, um, we did notice that the percent of reported water shortages is going up relative to the number of reports with um, 85 reports or about 23% of um, the May data set noting a local shortage. Next slide, please. Compared to last month, we are seeing a larger proportion of agencies reporting that various limitations on water use are in effect, whether it be in terms of timing or type of water use. Agencies are also stepping up their game and in increasing messaging to customers through various mediums and addressing reported water waste. Next slide, please. So during our last board update and earlier in this presentation, we mentioned simple steps we can all take to help weather the drought and reduce urban water use by 15%. Knowledge is power, so we do encourage people to take some time to assess existing water use in and out of the house, even if it's just looking at the water bill and seeing how much water 15% savings would require. The information we provide for these updates is also available um, on our water conservation portal either um, as an Excel sheet or as a Tableau dashboard. Also, we're working in conjunction with Save Our Water to continue to provide useful information. We should love water and hate waste. So show your love outdoors by adding mulch and efficiently irrigating landscapes indoors. Shower better with efficient shower heads. We can also find and fix leaky toilets and faucets. Um, and with that, I am finished and ready to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Pinheiro. Just appreciate, as always, the, the really good work uh, on the conservation side. Um, yeah, thank you for the flag on, on the lag of data. I know folks will be interested to know how effective we're being in our messaging and Californians are in their efforts to conserve here. Um, so just appreciate the note about when we can start to expect data to start to arrive. And, um, you know, uh, point taken as well that we're needing to make sure our urban water suppliers are reporting timely so that we can understand and track uh, these important goals here uh, as we enter the driest uh, months of this summer, as you noted, and have the greatest opportunity to all be collectively contributing to uh, the, this drought response and the challenging circumstances we find ourselves now, but certainly as we continue to say, will if we find ourselves with another dry winter and the need to prepare now for, for that to be the case. So just thank you, really appreciate it. I don't have any further question here um, other than to say just I also appreciate the practical tips. I know I myself have my shower bucket in uh, the shower to catch my warm up water um, and uh, use for irrigation of my, my house plants and plants outdoors. So um, small amounts can add up, 
uh, and truly, um, it isn't just the efforts of uh, individual Californians in their homes, but all of our agencies here as we collectively manage work and work through drought. And since, again, this drought, uh, drought scenarios here are so common to California, we, we know how to respond. And so we need to just work back those muscles again, learn how to, uh, to, to conserve it just a bit more, and all collectively meet some uh, important targets here. So thank you. Board members, any questions or thoughts? Okay, hearing none, thank you. I appreciate again the, the update and uh, look forward to, to further discussion in this space. Uh, okay, well that concludes item number three. Um, we can go ahead, so, um, I, and again, I appreciate everyone's time on those. So uh, uncontested items number four and five, uh, four is no longer uncontested and item number five, we're gonna pull for a discussion, you know, um, since we have that tranche of items and then our, our main item number six uh, here, our larger uh, likely one on stormwater permitting, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break, um, give ourselves a little space and uh, we can come back here a little more refreshed for items four and five at about 11 o'clock. So uh, see you there in a moment.
All right, everyone, it's 11 o'clock, and I think we can begin to return here. Hope everyone had a good break, and now we can continue on to item number four. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, I have a very brief presentation to uh, introduce the item, and then I'm happy to answer any questions that the board members may have about it. Um, um, I am Barbara Baginska from the TMBL and Planning Division in Region 2. And today we are asking you to consider approving a resolution to amend our region space plan. The amendment would establish a bacteria TMDL for the beaches in Pillar Point Harbor and Venice Beach on the San Mateo coast. In addition, this amendment would update the bacteria objectives by incorporating into the basin plan the statewide objectives that the State Board established in 2018. Next slide, please. So the TMDL would address bacteria impairment at the beaches in Pillar Point Harbor and Venice Beach. And it would require corrective actions in a phased approach, which first addresses controllable sources of bacteria, such as sewer overflows or leaks, close to the beaches. And after the first five years, if our targets are still not met, the focus shifts to controllable sources in a wider radius from the beach. So if the TMDL is not achieved in phase one, the parties would implement additional bacteria controls in phase two, and also would conduct uh, more advanced monitoring and microbial source testing to better target bacteria discharges. And overall, the TMDL targets are meant to be achieved in 15 years or less, and preferably in less, a lesser amount of time. Next slide, please. So the amendment will also update the, um, the basin plan to reflect the new statewide bacteria water quality objectives for protecting water contact recreation in coastal and non-coastal waters and modify the text in our basin plan, uh, chapter three, water quality objectives and chapter four, implementation plans to reflect the new objectives. Um, it will also make small editorial changes to remove outdated information. Next slide, please. So uh, with that, we recommend that you approve the basin plan amendment and direct your staff to submit it to the Office of Administrative Law for approval. We didn't receive any additional comment letters during the state board public uh, review process. Um, so, and we also conducted an extensive um, uh, consultations uh, during the uh, development of the TMDL and also after our original board approved the TMDL to, um, to make sure that all the stakeholders in this difficult last year understand what the requirements of the TMDL are and also um, that we could uh, explain any questions that they had. So, um, we had uh, answered all the questions that we received during the uh, regional board public review process, and we um, responded to all the comments during that time. And with that, thank you. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Ms. Baginski. Uh, Baginska, apologies. And um, we have uh, one public commenter, um, and is why we pulled it from the uncontested mm -hmm. item. And that is uh, Brenda Bass. So I invite Ms. Bass to uh, speak. Good morning. Uh, yes, it's still morning. Uh, members of the board, I'm Brenda Bass uh, of Downey Brand, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the cities of Sunnyvale and Mountain View. Um, and this, these comments are directed not at the TMDL portion, but at the um, bacteria objectives portion. So just to be clear on the division there. Um, on February 4th, 2019, the State Water Board uh, adopted bacteria provisions and 
water quality standards variance policy that and made that available to regional boards to incorporate into their basin plans. In addition, the bacteria provisions superseded current REC 1 objectives in the basin plan. Nevertheless, the regional board for the San Francisco region has incorporated the numeric bacteria objectives into their basin plans and are acting, asking you to approve those today. On behalf of the cities of Sunnyvale and Mountain View, we ask that you please remand this action to the regional board because it does not incorporate any regulatory flexibility or implementation provisions for those objectives that were anticipated by the bacteria provisions and required by water code section 13242. Recognizing natural and uncontrollable sources, the bacteria provisions provided for such flexibility in the implementation of the, the objectives, including the use of reference systems, natural source exclusion approaches, high flow suspension of the REC1 use, seasonal suspension of the REC1 use, a limited REC1 use, and the use of variances in the interim. This issue is very important to the cities because despite the cities having rigorous MS4 and sewer collection system operation and maintenance programs, um, the cities are suffering through costly federal litigation at the moment, which is alleging that the city's sewers are leaking to the MS4 and causing or contributing to bacterial exceedances in urban creeks based on the REC1 standard. When there's no evidence to, to support REC1 uses existing in all urban creeks in the South Bay area, or that these stringent objectives are needed year round to protect any existing level of use. Instead, the regional, the regional board designated these uses presuming they exist without any supporting evidence. Pairing an unconfirmed use with a stringently applied objective with no implementation provisions or compliance schedules won't help cities comply and it is unreasonable and contrary to legal requirements. The cities have enjoyed a very good working relationship with the regional board over the years. And previously the cities were formally requested one or more of the implementation provisions in the bacterial projected objectives to be included in the basin plan for that region instead of objectives being stringently applied immediately and everywhere all the time. Unfortunately, the regional, the regional board did not respond to that request and the cities felt compelled to file a petition for review with the state board. That petition is on very similar issues and it's currently held in abeyance. An appearance and request for flexibility was also made before the regional board when the basin plan amendment was before them and no modifications were made. Our ask here today is that you remand the basin plan amendment related to adding the newer bacteria provision objectives. The regional, the regional board should be asked to add the most important part, recognizing the practical nature of achieving bacteria objectives, which is currently missing from the amendment, and describe the way that permittees can comply and when they must comply. Water Code Section 13242 explicitly requires a description of the nature of the actions necessary to achieve, to achieve objectives, a time schedule for those actions, and a description of surveillance needed to determine compliance. None of these implementation provisions are included in the proposed amendment. And the cities, again, are very happy to work with the regional, the regional board uh, on remand to uh, develop reasonable implementation provisions, particularly related to municipal stormwater. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bass. Um, sounds like these were uh, items that were brought before the regional board, but the regional board didn't um, necessarily take them in. Can I just ask a, a point of clarification? Uh, as I understand, there's a 15-year time schedule for this um, TMDL, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. And okay. also, um, as I said, this TMDL, uh, this basin plan amendment consists of two elements, the TMDL and then the um, update of the basin plan to include the statewide bacteria objectives. These objectives were um, uh, 
approved by the state board and um, they uh, basically apply uh, everywhere in um, California because together with the implementation provisions that are included in the um, water quality control plan for the inland surface waters and closed base and estuaries in California. And as such, they already um, apply in our region. Uh, so we are, this is basically uh, almost like an editorial action when we uh, revise the basin plan to um, update it uh, with the objectives that already apply. So, and including the implementation provisions that are included in that basin plan. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Any questions from fellow board members or colleagues? And, or any further comment from uh, folks in the program to Mrs. Bass's uh, request? Oh, uh, do you need to be, uh, Ms. O'Hara, do you need to be unmuted here? here. I am. Should, there we go. Sorry, forgot again. Um, yeah, I'm the lead for uh, Barbara's section. And I will just um, say also that the implementation actions that the commenter asked for are available to Region 2. We are dealing with Sunnyvale and Mountain View separately and are considering their requests and working with them um, outside of this TMDL and water quality objective update. Thank you. Uh, fellow board colleagues? Okay. I appreciate the comments, uh, but at this point, I'm, I'm not moved to uh, change the uh, uh, direction to, uh, or to remand this back to the regional board and would just voice my support at this point for the item. Any other board members though, uh, with questions or, or comment here? I appreciate the comment and the concern for flexibility. And certainly I, I believe, you know, that's what the bacteria provisions provided. And so the, the clarification that you know, that is a, a statewide policy that does apply in the San Francisco Bay region as well, you know, um, for me carries weight. And so for that reason, I, I concur um, and I'm prepared to move to adopt the item. Thank you, board member. I'll second. Thank you. Ms. Townsend, can you please call the roll call vote? Board Member McGuire? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Board Member Morgan? Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you all. Thank you as well. Uh, the vote carries and the item is adopted. Thank you everyone and appreciate Ms. Bass your comments and just do, I encourage the, the cities to continue to work with the regional board. Uh, it's sounding like there is some flexibility there uh, that is being sought that can be um, addressed. So thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to our next item, uh, which was also uncontested, but we have pulled so as to have a more of a discussion. Um, you know, and so really appreciate uh, Ms. Ohaka here, uh, leading us off on consideration of a pros resolution delegating authorities for the administration of the general fund allocation of 10 million for drinking water drought emergencies from the Budget Act of 2021. This was uh, just recently passed and I just wanna thank everyone for the really incredible, great quick work in getting a resolution here before us so that we can already start to get the dollars out the door. He having heard here just from Darren recently, how the continued need um, is certainly out there and our communities in it for emergency response and drought. So just thank everyone for the great quick work and I'll, I'll hand it over to Ms. Ohaka. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Esquivel, members of the board. My name is Jasmine Ohaka, Supervising Engineer in the Division of Financial Assistance. And today we are asking the board to consider a proposed resolution to delegate authorities for the administration of the recent $10 million general fund allocation to address drought emergencies. We will also be providing a general overview of our drought response work today. Later in the presentation, you will hear from Art Hinojosa from the Department of Water Resources, as well as Sarah Reese from our State Water Board's Emergency Management Program, 
part of the Office of Research Planning and Performance. Next slide, please. So as background, on April 21st, 2021, the governor issued a proclamation of a state of emergency in Mendocino and Sonoma counties due to drought conditions in those counties. And then on May 10th and July 8th, 2021, the governor sequentially expanded the state of emergency to include a total of 50 counties due to worsening drought conditions. And cur these current drought conditions are anticipated to continue through 2022. Next, please. This slide shows state water board funding provided during the previous drought from 2014 to 2017 in terms of emergency response. The state water board funded over 350 projects at a total of approximately 55.5 million. And a majority of these were related to well repairs and bottled water provision. Next, please. This map shows our existing regional or statewide programs that could be used for drought related emergencies, both for interim type solutions such as bottled water or hauled water provisions, um, and also technical assistance, as well as long term solutions such as well repair and replacement. There is approximately leave 48 million remaining in these agreements. We've made significant investments in the Central Valley, but as you can see, we lack coverage in many areas of the state. So to address this, we are currently working to try to expand our statewide capabilities. And we're also starting to work with counties to assess their needs and develop programs for immediate drought response, such as bottled water and hauled water. Um, and then in the long term, we hope to work with these same counties to improve their resiliency. Next, please. This map shows the locations of our more recent emergency funding requests that we've received related to drought issues. And we anticipate more and more of these will be coming from outside of the service areas of our existing regional programs. Next, please. This slide summarizes our existing funding sources that could be used to respond to drought related requests. All part of our safe and affordable funding for equity and resilience or safer program. We have about 12 million remaining from last year's allocation of the safe and affordable drinking water fund uh, reserved for this interim period before the next fund expenditure plan is adopted. We will be proposing a certain amount in this fiscal year 2021-22 fund expenditure plan to go towards interim supplies and emergencies for both public water systems that are out of compliance or at risk. Um, as well as for state smalls and domestic wells. So I also wanted to put in a plug here for the upcoming release of that fiscal year 2021-22 fund expenditure plan for the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, hopefully on August 6th. So we would appreciate your comments back on that. Um, going back to the table highlighted here is what we are requesting delegated authority for today the 10 million from the general fund, which should be available for you soon. And then lastly, we have an older appropriation of the general fund, AB 74, provision 2.5, which can fund repairs in O&M for failing drinking water and wastewater systems. Next, please. For interagency coordination on drought funding and response, um, over the past few months, we have been having regular coordination calls with our colleagues at DWR to coordinate roles and identify which types of projects are appropriate to be funded by each agency for both drought emergency response and then also for those long-term resiliency projects. And Art will say more on this in a few moments. Um, at the moment now, though, I'm going to invite Sarah Reese from the State Water Board's Emergency Management Program 
to speak to our coordination with Cal OES. Sierra? Sierra is here. Um, I lead the State Water Board's Emergency Management Program, and we are leading ongoing coordination efforts with Cal OES uh, to ensure that we have clear roles in drought emergency response situations. This also includes for urgent unmet needs that these requests are using the proper SEMS channels or the standardized emergency management systems um, system that we use for emergency management within the state. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I now invite Art Tino Hosa to say more about DWR's drought funding. Good morning. Um, so the department uh, with its latest budget um, act was receiving about $500 million uh, in support of drought funding. Um, as you can see in the slide here, 200 has been designated to support small community drought relief, uh, 100 million for urban community drought relief, and 200 million for grants to fund multi-benefit projects. So um, our process as, we're, as it's evolving, um, we're looking at the more immediate needs uh, with a lot of the small communities that we've been discussing and have been problematic in droughts past with the 200 million uh, for um, small community drought relief. We're coordinating, as Jasmine said, with the Water Board uh, weekly on assessing projects. And even just last week, we, we are taking on a handful of projects that were on, on the board's uh, get to really quickly list, um, coupled with some that had come to our attention since the last drought. And we're hopeful to start moving some of this money um, as early as next month. We're in the process of developing guidelines uh, to characterize um, our provisions for availing the money. Uh, the urban community drought relief and about half of the multi-benefit projects money will probably go out uh, on a single solicitation. And if all goes according to our schedule, we'll be able to avail those uh, guidelines in October. And then we'll finish off the multi-benefit project uh, money um, next year, probably next summer. We're in the process of developing all these things as the money was just availed recently. Um, there are, could be some qualifications that come about as subsequent trailer bill language is finalized. Right now, it's looking like um, with regards to the small community relief, um, we'll be focusing on, on those communities that are the most vulnerable, um, that have been already identified, projects that have uh, already been identified with the water board uh, in coordination with their safer effort, uh, in addition to projects that come up as, as the drop continues. Um, we coordinate again with the board continuously on what these things should be. We're also looking to uh, engage small uh, communities um, per the uh, the CDAG report, uh, where we have an idea of where some of uh, the higher risk communities are. Um, our, it is our hope to, to use some of this to engage them, find out where their systems could be improved to uh, reduce their risk and kind of lean into projects that might do so before they become the emergency uh, that, that we're starting to see in some communities already. Um, eligible uh, recipients uh, per the legislation is pretty uh, pretty comprehensive. Um, we're looking at uh, public agencies, utilities, special districts, colleges, universities, mutual water companies, nonprofits, regional water management groups, and tribes. Our urban community drought relief coupled with some multi-benefit project money will be uh, looking more at long-term, or not long-term per se, but um, more the traditional grant uh, type of projects, whereas in the 200 it might be grants, it might be directed assistance such as we did during the last drought where the department actively engages a contractor and our own staff uh, of engineers to help develop and implement uh, solutions to some of the problems that communities have been suffering. And that's it, back to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Art. Next slide, please. So going back to the reason for our idea him today, uh, Senate Bill 129 added to the Budget Act of 2021 and appropriated 10 million to the State Water Board to address emergency needs throughout the state. This allocation will go into our larger safer program as part of funds we can draw from to provide interim water supplies and address emergency situations during the drought. The resolution proposed today includes delegated authority for the Division of Financial Assistance's Deputy Director to approve or deny emergency drinking water funding requests 
as well as to execute, implement, and amend funding agreements that result. Next slide, please. As a reminder, for more information, please visit the State Water Board's Drought Information and Updates page, uh, which refers to our drought funding page um, that goes over in more detail what programs we have and how to apply for funding. Next, please. And then here are contacts for drought assistance. Matt Pavelcheck leads our Division of Financial Assistance's Drought and Emergency Funding Program. And other contacts listed here are for our existing regional and statewide programs through third parties. And so at this point, we are happy to take any questions. Um, I did want to mention that we do have an update to the resolution. Uh, since Governor Newsom has approved Senate Bill 120, 129, Item six should read chapter 69, where we currently have placeholder text. And so with that update to the resolution, staff recommend that the board adopt the resolution. A good recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Ohaka, uh, for the great work truly on, on all this. And thank you to the Department of Water Resources for the ongoing good coordination between our programs and Cal OES. Um, again, this is a, a whole of government, all of state uh, response, it has to be, and that includes our local partners in the counties. And so just uh, appreciate uh, everyone's incredible work and our technical assistance providers in these existing programs that help us uh, be responsive. But there again, important to note that we don't have those existing agreements in all, in all counties or areas in the state. And so are really relying on in the emergency side of things, uh, for folks to work through their county emergency responders and up through the emergency response system that's been created to help us manage and understand <clears throat> this evolving uh, crisis that we have before us. So just thank you. Thank you for the great work. I have no question, fully supportive here. Um, any any uh, questions or comments from uh, fellow board colleagues? And we, have do, we do have one public uh, speaker on this item. And if hearing none, uh, we can actually, oh, uh, board member Firestone, uh, you're I unmuted, I apologize. After, I can ask after the public speaker. Okay, then uh, we'll quickly call up Eric uh, Oriana to give us a um, comment here from the Community Water Center. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Good, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, wanted to provide a comment on behalf of Community Water Center. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're very happy to see this resolution uh, being brought before the board. Uh, these critical drought assistance funds uh, will help ensure community residents access to safe and clean drinking water uh, during one of the worst droughts to hit California in over 100 years. Uh, we also know that $10 million almost certainly won't be enough to, uh, for emergency drought response and more will be needed. Uh, it is clear that climate change is having a huge impact on our communities and low income communities of color uh, bear a disproportionate and significant burden. Uh, hotter and drier conditions as a result of climate change are causing farmers to increasingly turn to groundwater sources. The Department of Water Resources domestic well outage reporting system uh, shows hundreds of domestic well outages uh, so far this year, uh, a 248% increase in domestic well outages from last year. And we know that due to the voluntary nature of the tool, uh, this is likely an undercount uh, of the true number of uh, dry well outages. These outages uh, pose an overt threat to communities, human rights, water, and California must act uh, to protect its residents. Uh, we urge the Water Board to work with the Department of Water Resources uh, to develop domestic well outage mitigation principles that hold groundwater sustainability agencies accountable to domestic well impacts caused by their unsustainable business practices. Groundwater sustainability agencies implementing domestic well impact mitigation programs could allow the water board to use funds like these $10 million to increase drought resiliency among at-risk water systems. Though we appreciate this much needed funding, holding agriculture accountable to its impacts is essential to protecting Californians' human right to water. Additionally, uh, we recommend the water board's work with the Department of Water Resources to include additional language in this year's proposed drought funding. Uh, the current proposed drought funding uh, does not have prioritization for disadvantaged communities, uh, does not expressly list uh, technical assistance funding, and does not require the Department of Water Resources to use such funding uh, to implement programs that proactively monitor 
and mitigate drought impacts to domestic wells, uh, including similar language will be integral to ensuring adequate response to drought impacts on disadvantaged communities. I appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to provide those comments and um, looking forward to continuing to collaborate uh, with water board members to uh, ensure California's human right to water. Thank you so much for your good comments and agree with you. Um, the 10 million ultimately will not be enough here uh, and we'll need to continue to make sure and monitor, advocate and ensure that we have the resources as a state collectively to make sure we're, we're addressing and taking care of our communities and know it's a continuum of effort and, and funding and dollars. Uh, but here um, needing to make sure we, we continue to have enough. So thank you for that point. Uh, fellow board colleagues, any uh, question? Board Member Firestone. Um, well, first, actually, I just wanted to follow up on that comment. Um, so, um, Mr. Ariana, you're saying that your concern with the current um, proposed resolution is that it doesn't have prioritization for disadvantaged communities, or is this something different? I believe he may have been referencing the Department of Water Resources um, POTS uh, or, okay. or program. But, but Mr. Ariana? I think you might have to be unmuted. Oh, yeah, hopefully folks are. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman, for the uh, opportunity to, to clarify. Yes, um, it, the, the comments are in regards to uh, the DWR's uh, pots of additional funding that uh, should be coming down the stream. Okay, thank thanks. you. Um, great, okay, a uh, couple questions. Um, and comments. So one is for Sarah. Um, you know, I, uh, there's a lot of challenges around figuring out how to um, collaborate and match up within drought OES services and this our assistance programs um, with what's needed on the ground. Um, and I'm you know, what I've heard is that because there isn't CDA funding yet, that that really limits what um, OES is, assistance is able to provide. Can you just give a little bit of a sense of, um, it sounds like there have been success stories in Northern California where, um, you know, folks with emergencies were able to go through the county, the county was able to respond through the appropriate, um, what normally would be the appropriate emergency services channels. Can you just give more of a sense of how that works? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, I can't speak to the CDAA funding for CalOES, um, but what I can tell you is that the best way to go about getting resources and needs met is to use the standardized emergency management systems that we have here in California. And essentially what that really means is that local level emergency response is really at the local level. And so when there's a need or a resource that's identified um, that's needed, whether it's drought or any other emergency, that that individual or system or whatever it is um, needs to request through the um, local emergency services. Um, sometimes that's an office, sometimes it's the actual emergency operations center. Uh, by doing that, it ensures that we're reducing um, the time that it takes to address that need because once it goes to that local level, it's pushed up through a chain of command. And so it provides us situational awareness, it reduces duplication of efforts, and it ensures that the resources that we need gets to the location that it needs to go in the quickest means possible. And um, that's also really important for tracking reasons. Um, in order to get reimbursement for any type of emergency, you need to go through those proper channels to be eligible for reimbursement. And so there's multiple reasons reasons why we do that, but that's how we manage emergencies in California, including drought. Great. Okay. That's really helpful. And I um, I know there's been an effort, um, Vice Chair and I have been involved with, and I know a number of um, our staff, including Office of Public Participation, um, on just trying to have um, more outreach to uh Folks, this was particularly in the San Joaquin Valley, but I'm sure there's efforts um, statewide, but just making sure that people know who their local um, emergency services um, contacts are so they know who to report things to. That's probably both at the individual um, household, but but probably even more so with um, with water, you know, small water systems. Um, 
who also I know are connecting with our um, district engineers. But it sounds like just the communication um, kind of outreach on just really clear this is who to contact um, locally is something that um, the more that we could clarify the how important that is to streamline and, and um, not just streamline, but um, really accelerate the urgency um, that each of these things are able to be addressed is, um, is something that would be, you know, it'd be great to, to find out more about how we're able to do that. Because um, I know, you know, certainly when in the last drought, when there are households that, um, that are dealing with challenges, they do not know who to contact. And it's really hard to try to navigate the system. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes even the folks that are contacted in the counties may not know who the right contacts are even in the county. <laughs> um, so just the more that we can facilitate that really important um, uh, information on how to respond, um, the better. I don't know what, what we're looking, what, what we've been doing on that. Right. Actually, we, we provide a lot of that information. So here at the Emergency Management Program, we do have the contacts for all the counties for emergency services. And so um, that information is available online for the local county um, like websites, but we do maintain like a comprehensive list for the state. So when people are unsure of that information, we do provide that. Um, and we're hoping to, um, we always provide that to whoever needs it. So um, that information is publicly available. And if it would be of assistance, I'm more than happy to provide that comprehensive list. Yeah, and it, it sounded like Office of Public Participation was working with you all and Division of Financial Assistance too to help spread that. That's good. Um, okay, and thanks, that's really helpful. Um, so my other question is for um, Jasmine. <laughs> um, so as you said, we are um, don't have as much set up for those areas outside of existing programs. And those are increasingly where the real hotspots are popping up because the, the drought is pretty extreme um, in, in Northern California. Um, can you just, it looked like RCAC was technically covering the whole state in their service area, but can you just say a little bit more about, um, you know, how we're looking at being able to deploy funds and assistance for assistance in those areas? Sure, um, that is correct. RCAC does have a statewide well repair and replacement program, uh, which started in our last drought um, and we have had discussions with them about possibly expanding their services to potentially provide bottled water. Um, so we're still talking through that, but we did think that it might be better to outreach to the counties um, and work at that local level and we could um, if counties are interested, uh, we could develop funding agreements with them either directly or through a third party um, where we could establish some services for them such as bottled water provision, um, hauled water in tanks if possible to kind of address these most immediate needs of the drought and then moving forward, uh, you know, through establishing those relationships with the county would set us up well to work with them uh, towards their long-term solutions and um, towards long-term resiliency for future drought. Great. So that's our plan. Um, and we will be kind of prioritizing counties that looked like they uh, would be most affected by drought, but it is true that we're starting to get contacted through other counties that are not necessarily on that top 10 list based on the data. So we'll, we're trying to be both strategic and then also responsive or reactive yeah. to the ones that are coming to us. And I'll just say on that, um, you know, I, I've seen um, and and heard how responsive um, DFA staff are in terms of, you know, 
practically all hours of the night outside of work, even outside of work hours, just being able to support responding to emergencies to make sure that people have um, have assistance. And I know that's not our, um, our typically our role in terms of emergency response. That's really something that the, um, you know, the emergency response system is set up for, but just um, appreciate how um, how responsive and just, um, I think, really caring our staff are and trying to make sure folks have assistance that they need. So I really appreciate that um, and just want to recognize that. Um, one other question or comment um, is, I, you know, I keep having trouble um, wrapping my head around how, and this was true at the, with the last drought, but how much assistance financial assistance we are actually providing or we have provided. And I know you, you um, one of your slides was um, giving some uh, data on that um, in terms of the emergency drought projects funded um, through the last drought. Um, but even that, I mean, just looking at it, the total funds listed are 55 million and, it, and I think you know, when we look at East Porterville, which was a very big <laughs> um, drought project, um, really expensive. I think it was close to that by itself. Um, and so we just know that the actual costs in terms of drought response are actually much bigger than than sort of the, the little pieces that, that we play. Um, and you know, as the state is looking at the funding we have at the state board, the funding now that DWR has, um, and, you know, thinking about our fund expenditure plan for SAFER, um, I just, I wonder if we can try and, and pull together a bigger picture of more of the full costs um, of the types of I mean, it, it seems like there's the response once there's actually an outage, but then there's that spectrum of we're an emergency to get something in place before the community is out entirely. And um, not all of that is from us. Some of it's from other agencies. I know it's hard to get all of that information, um, but it, I, I would just say the more that we can have a, a more comprehensive picture of what the state, um, you know, had to invest in last drought, it just helps us kind of calibrate for what to expect in this, you know, even more acute situation that we're in this year. Hopefully it won't be as long, <laughs> knock on wood, but um, anyway, so that I, I guess, you know, I'm thinking about that particularly in the context of, you know, we have these fund expenditure plans, these um, DWRs looking at how to spend its funds. And so I think the more that that we can all get a handle on that would help us think about how we prioritize and, and also what the true need is. So we'll, we'll be happy to look into that and figure out the best way to do that. I think, um, I think you're right. It's kind of a continuum because, you know, to the extent that we're contributing to the overall vi viability and resiliency of, of um, systems, you know, it helps them um, work through droughts. On the other hand, if, if we, it's not really that helpful to dump everything we do into one big bucket and say this, this is all drought related. And so I think, it, yeah. you know, I think we, you know, we need to develop some categories and and make yeah. sure not to. I mean, to your point, we don't want to understate what our investments and contributions are, but I also think that we don't want to be so broad that it it kind of loses meaning. So yeah, we'll be able totally to agree. on that and you know, kind of get back to all board members with kind of. Um, you know, as we as we evolve, I think that this I I, I think that what um, what Jasmine provided was you know a good a good kind of starting baseline for us to work from. Oh, absolutely! I think it was really helpful. And actually, those are the numbers I I also have seen. I think that this was a challenge at the end of the last drought too, of just how do we um what do we classify as what and you know look at sort of the full picture between the different agencies that are funding that are contributing funding. Um, so I, I, you know, I fully support this, uh, <laughs> this resolution. Um, I certainly, um, would move for adoption with the proposed changes, um, but also want to create space for any of the 
for other board member discussions or questions. Hello, colleagues. Okay. I'll just nothing say, here, would, oh, oh, sorry. Vice Chair, no, no, I was means, just say Chair. nothing here, but I would take that as, um, as a motion that I would second. Great, thank you. And I was just gonna say, again, I appreciate the incredible coordination that's going on. I know that we are having really good conversation with DWR and including uh, Cal OES there, making sure that we know that spread uh, to board member Firestone's point and are making sure that we're, we're understanding where our investments are going and how it all adds up together. You know, I'll, I'll say a, a lot of our challenge here, certainly with drought as an emergency is that uh, it doesn't receive the federal support that other emergencies do like wildfire, like hurricanes, like earthquakes that um, help buoy and ensure that these natural disasters don't just continue to, to weigh down onto our systems. Whereas drought is slow moving, it lingers, and there is no federal uh, dollar usually, at least with the Stafford Act, the, the usual uh, sort of flow of dollars that goes from the feds for these sorts of things. And it's because it is so slow moving and oftentimes layered in with just uh, systemic challenges that our, our water systems face. So we need to continue to, to, to do better on uh, understanding those costs and importantly, uh, ensuring that we have the dollars and resources to respond appropriately. So thank you all board members. Ms. Uh, Johnson, can you please call the roll call vote? Yes. Board member Firestone? Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. Board member McGuire? Aye. Board member Morgan? Aye. And Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. It carries and uh, the resolution is adopted. Uh, thank you everyone for the time to just do a little more of a deep dive into our drinking water work and appreciate the, again, the great work around the resolution generally. So uh, we can either part for lunch or continue to work through lunch and, and try to get out of here. How are my fellow board colleagues feeling? Um, you know, an hour 15 may be enough. Um, let's see, on the tail end of item number six, we do have board member reports and the executive director discussion, but uh, usually doesn't take too long. I'll, I'll just gut check with uh, board colleagues if they'd like to go ahead and just take a lunch now and then take up uh, item number six or continue to work through and uh, just try to get out and I'll have a late lunch. And if it helps the board members and their consideration, uh, we have one panel for this item and then three speakers. I would really love 30 minutes lunch or, you know, just to get that. Yeah, no, that I appreciate that. Uh, I, we can take a, a 30 minute lunch here then and uh, give everyone a nice break. Let's go ahead and, you know, we'll we'll do a, you know, 45 ish minute lunch if that's helpful uh, board member and we can actually do like 1230. We can just come back uh, at that point. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll see you all here after lunch at 1230. Thank you.
All right, everyone. I hope everybody had a good lunch. We can begin to uh, return here. And as my fellow board colleagues join me on camera here, I will go ahead and read uh, this opening statement for uh, this public hearing that I have to read out. So the State Water Board will now hold a public hearing to provide information and receive oral comments on the draft statewide municipal stormwater permit, reissuance and draft time schedule order for the California Department of Transportation, referred to as Caltrans. Uh, I'm Joaquin Esquivel. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, reintroducing everybody. Uh, for procedural matters, this hearing uh, on the draft statewide Caltrans Municipal Stormwater Permit reissuance and draft time schedule order is being held in accordance with the public notice dated June 25th, 2021 to receive oral comments pertaining to the proposed permit reissuance. The due date for submittal of written comments is Friday, August 27th, 2021 by 12 noon. If you intend to speak on this item, please follow the instructions on our website to attain a password and log into the meeting. Please fill out a virtual blue speaker card and mark it with the words uh, Caltrans stormwater permit or type in the words. Uh, when you're called to speak, please slowly state your name and identify the organizations you represent. If any, uh, time limits may be imposed on oral comments to allow all participants the opportunity to be heard. I don't think we'll be needing those uh, given the number of uh, folks today and we will now proceed with the presentation uh, from staff. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Ms. Boyd, if uh, you're speaking currently, you, you may still be on mute. Oh, there. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. I am Mary Boyd with the Municipal Stormwater Program in our Division of Water Quality. I'll be giving the presentation today. In addition, Diana Messina, Ryan Mallory Jones, and Leo Cosentini are here to assist in answering questions after our staff presentation. This hearing is for two orders the draft California Department of Transportation statewide NPDES municipal stormwater permit and the corresponding draft time schedule order. Throughout this presentation, I refer to the Department of Transportation as Caltrans or the department. And I refer to the draft <coughs> Caltrans statewide NPDES municipal stormwater permit as the draft permit. Today, I'll highlight significant changes in the draft permit as compared to the existing permit. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer any questions you might have. Next slide, please. I'll start with some background information on the existing permit. Caltrans owns and operates statewide highways and facilities with storm sewer systems that discharge to surface water. The existing permit <clears throat> regulates discharges from the highways, rights of ways, parking lots, maintenance facilities, and other facilities that have the potential to generate significant amounts of pollutants. The existing permit was an amended in 2014 to implement 84 existing total maximum daily loads. I refer to total maximum daily loads as TMDLs. TMDL implementation is in two parallel tracks in the existing permit, a compliance unit system and a demonstration of compliance. The existing permit requires monitoring to assess the effectiveness of control measures. <clears throat> this assessment includes <clears throat> any modifications necessary to achieve waste load allocations. Where an assessment indicates that control me measures are inadequate to achieve waste load allocations, then Caltrans must implement improved control measures. The existing permit provides a TMDL in permit compliance date of 2034. Going on, the existing permit requires a stormwater management plan for use by all Caltrans districts. The existing permit expired in 2017 and has been administratively extended until the effective date of a future permit reissuance. Next, I highlight the draft permit. Next slide, please. As shown here, the draft permit has the main portion, the order, and seven attachments. Together, 
These are all the draft permit. This format is user friendly with similar requirements grouped together. Today, I'll highlight significant, significant changes and additions to the stormwater management plan, total maximum daily loads, trash and monitoring and reporting attachments. I'll also highlight requirements in the draft time schedule order. Next slide, please. The draft permit continues requirements from the existing permit, and it proposes new requirements per updated regulations, policies, and resolutions. For the draft permit, we removed the TMDL compliant, compliance unit tracking system because we found there was no direct correlation to compliance with waste load allocations. And the compliance unit system might result in control measures where none are needed or vice versa, not enough control measures where more control measures are needed. Thus, the draft permit does not include the compliance unit tracking system. Going on, the draft permit requires a demonstration of compliance with TMDL waste load allocations. And the waste load allocations are specified in the fact sheet and in attachment D. Next slide, please. Going forward with significant proposed changes, the draft permit continues the trash requirements that we established in our 2017 13383 order. This 2017 order required submittal of a map identifying Caltrans significant trash generating areas, identification of the selected trash treatment controls, and Caltrans method for demonstrating full capture system equivalency. The draft permit implements the trash provisions, including requirements for a trash assessment methodology plan, submittal of a revised trash assessment map that identifies significant trash generation areas and other requirements. The draft permit also revises post-construction treatment requirements. The trigger for installation of stormwater treatment control was revised from the existing one acre down to 10,000 square feet. We'll go into a little more detail on that later. We included an asset management, we included asset management to address climate change and impacts and infrastructure resiliency. Next slide, please. Continuing on with significant proposed changes, we modified mandatory characterization monitoring and replaced it with group watershed or regional monitoring programs. Characterization monitoring may be continued to be performed when necessary. We require that labs be certified under the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. And we require electronic reporting into our statewide database for public access of all data. The next slide will highlight the draft time schedule order. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the draft time schedule order provides a schedule and milestones to comply with 62 waste load allocations for pollutant water body combinations. The draft time schedule order replaces the existing in permit compliance date of 2034. We will issue the time schedule order under a California Water Code section 13300. In the time schedule order, we require a TMDL compliance plan with defined strategies for compliance with all 62 TMDL pollutants. This plan requires that Caltrans determine how it will demonstrate compliance with the TMDL, options for which are provided in the time schedule order, and we require Caltrans to have a plan of implementation designed to achieve that demonstration of compliance. We do require demonstration of compliance with waste load allocations, which are tracked through implementation and reporting in a TMDL annual status report. We include three-year milestones to maintain scheduled compliance progress and 
we require final compliance by December 2034 and a final report by June 2035. Next slide, please. This slide highlights the purpose of the fact sheet in the draft permit. Attachment A is, has the fact sheet and it includes a rationale for the permit requirements, detailed information on the TMDLs, new details, formulas, and calculations for sediment and temperature load allocations in the North Coast region. It includes department specific waste load allocations, it includes any grouped waste load allocations as specified in TMDLs. And it identifies individual TMDL compliance dates. Next slide, please. Going on to attachment C, the stormwater management plan requirements are in attachment C. <clears throat> We require an updated stormwater management plan that incorporates updated requirements. For example, we clarified this section on hazards to wildlife caused by best management practices. We made this its own section and titled it environmentally friendly best management practices. We included procedures for using wildlife friendly and 100% biodegradable best management practices. We added a requirement for removal of any best management practice when no longer needed and removal and replacement of any best management practice that has trapped wildlife. We added a new section on storage of concrete grindings. We require the prevention of unauthorized discharges caused by stormwater that has contacted the grindings. We require control measures that prevent stormwater from, from contacting these stockpiles. Going on, we revised the vegetation control plan. We added requirements to evaluate the presence of wind that may cause drift of chemicals. Going on, we added a new section to address climate change where we incorporated Caltrans existing asset management plan directly into the draft permit. The asset management requires assessments of stormwater structures that could be impacted by climate change. We require an assessment of impact caused by extreme temperature, drought, heavy rainfall, flooding, wind, wildfires, and sea level rise. We require that results of assessments be used to strengthen the storm system's resilience to climate and severe weather impacts. For post-construction treatment controls, the trigger is revised for projects with 10,000 square feet. This is down from the existing permit that requires controls for projects of one acre or more. This revision downwards is consistent with other regional water board municipal stormwater permits. There are some exceptions to this requirement that depends on how far Caltrans has progressed in a design at the time the permit is adopted. Next slide, please. Attachment D has the total maximum daily load implementation requirements. All 88 TMDLs are listed. Some TMDLs have multiple pollutants. We have three main categories for TMDL implementation. Category one is the baseline category. It includes TMDLs that require compliance with the draft permit. These requirements for these TMDLs are described in basin plan amendments. Category two TMDLs require additional region specific requirements that go above and beyond complying with baseline requirements described in category one. Again, the additional region specific requirements are described in the adopted TMDLs and basin plan amendments. <clears throat> category three TMDLs are those that are regulated under time schedule order are under the time schedule order. 
and require more time for Caltrans to come into compliance. In general, these are TMDLs with past or near future compliance deadlines. There are 62 TMDLs in this category. We do require compliance by the year 2034. Next slide, please. Continuing on with TMDL requirements, we do merge the four new TMDLs into the existing permit list of TMDLs. There are now 88 TMDLs for compliance. Further, we require submittal of a TMDL compliance plan with details on how Caltrans is to comply with each waste load allocation. We require submittal of an annual compliance status report. We, we require submittal of region-specific reports, and we encourage participation in cooperative agreements. Next slide, please. This slide highlights the trash reduction requirements. Trash reduction was not part of the existing permit. That's because the trash provisions were adopted after the existing permit was adopted. We implement trash control re requirements adopted under the trash provisions. We require Caltrans to install, operate, and maintain any combination of full capture systems and multi-benefit projects, meet three-year trash reduction milestones for the years 2025, 2028, and 2030, we require Caltrans to coordinate efforts with other permittees subject to the trash provisions. We require Caltrans to submit a trash assessment methodology plan. We require Caltrans to submit a revised trash assessment map, provide the status of trash reduction milestones in annual reports, provide an annual assessment of trash reduction and demonstrate full compliance with trash requirements by December 2nd, 2030. The above requirements implement the trash provisions. Next slide, please. I just wanna highlight the trash reduction milestones in the draft permit. Again, these milestones were required on the trash provisions. We use the trash reduction milestones in terms of acreage of trash reduction. The milestones are a percent of Caltrans baseline of trash generation acreage. The draft permit requires Caltrans to develop a revised trash assessment map, which will provide updated baseline acreage. We require trash reduction to be reported annually. We require that the three-year milestones be met as follows. First milestone, by December 2nd, 2025, we require full capture system equivalency at 35% or more of the 16,645 acres of significant trash and generating areas identified in Caltrans April 2019 trash reduction plan. The second milestone by December 2nd, 2028, we require full, check, full capture system equivalency at 70% or more of acres identified as significant trash generating areas that are identified in the revised trash assessment map. This revised map is required under the draft permit. The third milestone is due by December 2nd, 2030. We require full capture system equivalency at 100% of the acres identified as significant, as significant trash generating areas in the revised map. Next slide, please. The draft permit has the monitoring requirements in one attachment. Receiving water monitoring 
may be performed via group or individual monitoring. Group monitoring includes monitoring such as regional monitoring programs, watershed group monitoring programs, cooperative monitoring programs with local agencies, and other cooperative monitoring programs. Caltrans currently participates in some programs and we, can, we encourage this particip participation. Runoff characterization monitor, monitoring may be performed for selected best management practices. There is some TMDL specific monitoring. Again, we encourage participation in group monitoring programs. We require that laboratory analysis comply with a sufficiently sensitive test methods rule. We also require that all analysis be performed by a laboratory certified under the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program that is certified for that particular analysis that is being performed. Next slide, please. Outreach. Our public process includes public workshops, focused stakeholder meetings, the draft permit posted for public comment, and a state water board hearing to receive oral comments. The public process also includes a response to comments and development of a final draft permit. State water board then holds a board meeting for consideration of adoption of the final draft permit. Throughout development of this draft permit, we held three out work, outreach workshops in 2019. The outreach workshops were in Reading, San Diego, and Sacramento. Here, we discussed proposed significant changes and answered questions during the workshops. We also held multiple focused stakeholder meetings throughout 2019 and throughout 2020. We discussed sections of the draft permit with Caltrans and with Coast Keepers. After the public comment periods ends on August 27th, we will then respond to comments and develop the final draft permit for consideration of adoption at a future board meeting. Next slide, please. This slide depicts the major milestones for the draft permit. The public comment period is from June 25th to August 27th. Our workshop was held on July 9th. And our board hearing is here today for oral comments. We hope to adopt the, the, draft, the final draft permit by spring of next year, but we don't have an exact date yet. Next slide, please. This slide shows staff members and their main program areas. I'm the unit chief and my contact information is presented on this, on this slide. Our webpage and trash implementation program webpage are also provided on this slide for more information. Chair Escobar and board members, I want to thank you for your time. This concludes our presentation. Diana Messina, Ryan Mallory Jones, and Leo Costantini will answer any questions or clarification that you may need. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. I, I know that this has been um, you know, an iterative process with Caltrans when it comes to uh, this trash program and just appreciate the continued good collaboration between the agencies. And to that vein, I believe we have a uh, our first panel here is uh, with some of our colleagues uh, from our sister agency. So we can go to the, the panel and then uh, comments, and then we can then have discussion here amongst board members. Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, I apologize, you're still muted. Thank you, uh, can you hear me now? We can, good afternoon. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair Esquivel, uh, Vice Chair, Board Members, for this opportunity to speak on the Caltrans draft permit reissuance. Uh, my name is Hardeep Takar. I am uh, working with Caltrans as the Acting Chief Environmental Engineer. And on behalf of Caltrans, I will be providing comments on the draft tentative order today. Uh, we would like to also thank the board staff for working with Caltrans on the development of this draft permit as we strive to align our compliance actions with both the state board and Caltrans's missions and achieve the best environmental outcome. Uh, my comments will cover the following items. Next slide, please. The Caltrans, I will go over the Caltrans stormwater program, the uniqueness of the Caltrans uh, municipal um, separate storm sewer system, um, collaboration to date with the state board staff and uh, Caltrans's request, uh, aligning compliance actions with existing funding frameworks and Caltrans's commitment. Next slide, please. Our stormwater program is committed to environmental stewardship, which is an integral part of Caltrans's business practices. Caltrans uses stormwater best management practices referred to as BMPs to either eliminate or minimize the discharge of pollutants and control stormwater runoff flows from its infrastructure. Caltrans implements water quality control measures through its stormwater management plan, capital projects funded by federal, state, and local programs, and by meeting the TMDL race load allocations. Through continued collaboration, we integrate stormwater management into practices that are compatible with our statutory responsibilities and ensure water quality benefits are achieved. Next slide, please. Safety is our number one goal and our infrastructure is passive and uniform. It's linear. Our right-of-way is typically less than 2% of the total in majority of our ADA TMDL watersheds. We employ one single land use, roads. We employ one single land use roads, and then we have no land use or enforcement authority over other dischargers. Uh, we do not have the ability to impose utility fees for increased mandates, and we're accountable to the legislature for efficient stewardship of state resources. The linear infrastructure typically includes impervious travelways, pervious shoulders, medians, vegetation, slopes, guardrails, sound walls, signage, among other features in a high vehicle speed environment. To keep the travelway clear of standing water and safe vehicle traffic um, for our workers and safe for our workers, our storm drains are designed to quickly convey runoff from our right of way resulting in a network of inlets, pipes, and outfalls that collect runoff and discharge it at frequent intervals. This combination of features is unique to the Caltrans right away and presents several challenges with implementing treatment technologies that require collection and conveyance of runoff to retention and infiltration systems within our constrained right away. In light of on-system challenges, we continue to innovate and engage with local partners and stakeholders to develop regional stormwater treatment projects off the state highway system right away. Next slide, please. Collaboration to date with, with state board staff. We, we appreciate state board and regional board staff collaboration again to align our permit requirements with Caltrans's business practices to drive efficiency and strengthen our commitment to environmental stewardship. Some of the following issues were resolved at the staff level over these collaborative efforts. Uh, the requirement to implement new post-construction stormwater treatment was limited to projects that are in the initial project development phase. Um, concurrence on consistent report submittal timelines, removed additional layers of approvals to facilitate efficient municipal coordination, safety exceptions for additional non-pollutant generating surfaces from post-construction treatment. Uh, these are vegetation control strips under guardrail systems, for example, and uh, more providing more clarity on the San Francisco Bay TMDL compliance targets, also uh, providing initial waste load allegations under the North Coast sediment TMDLs, 
and also with discussions related to vegetation management plan practices, including the need to address wildfire fuel management. Next slide, please. Caltrans faces challenges in implementing the current draft permit, and we request continued collaboration in the following areas. Um, aligning permit requirements with Caltrans' statutory responsibilities and project, project delivery process, uh, promoting consistency in the development of compliance actions to be included in the TMDO compliance demonstration plan for efficient implementation, and then timely approvals of Caltrans submittals to help align our compliance actions with existing funding frameworks. Next slide, please. We request that the state board consider lowering the post-construction treatment requirement trigger um, to only apply to the watersheds that are subject to TMDL requirements or that have 303D listed impaired water bodies. This will help direct investments that result in maximum water quality benefit by implementing control measures both on and off the state highway system through regional partnerships. Next slide, please. Under TMDL implementation requirements, the methodology under our 2012 permit used pollutant categories to provide a consistent statewide approach. The 2021 draft permit requires switching to specific individual pollutant requirements that have race load allocations, which will uh, need to be individually negotiated with the regional boards. The compliance demonstration process, the 2012 permit allowed a consistent approach using compliance units, one compliance unit per one acre treated uh, to track progress. The 2012 permit requires demonstrating compliance with waste load allocations. Next slide, please. For the TMDL implementation requirements, the 2012 permit compliance unit requirements aligned with our existing funding framework. The 2021 version has the potential to delay with existing funding frameworks as we align it with existing funding frameworks due to statewide implementation plan submittal required one year after adoption of the permit. In addition, Caltrans will need to determine its share of waste load allocation responsibility before committing funds to local partnerships. Caltrans requests the state board and the regional boards facilitate establishing waste load allocations in a timely manner that is consistent statewide in order to help compliance actions align them with existing funding frameworks and accelerate implementation of water quality improvements both on system and off system regional partnerships. Next slide, please. This permit requires Caltrans to develop a statewide trash assessment within six months of the approval of its trash assessment methodology, perform receiving water monitoring to qualify changes in trash levels, uh, and develop GIS mapping for significant trash generation areas and include interim timelines um, and includes interim timelines for addressing SDGAs, the significant trash generation areas by years 2025, 2028, and all of the significant trash generation areas by 2030. Next slide, please. The trash control implementation requirements um, from 2016 uh, were complied with through the Caltrans' submittal of the 2019 statewide trash implementation plan. Caltrans plans to continue to proceed with the trash implementation plans and efforts under, already underway. Caltrans request state board and regional boards facilitate establishing a trash assessment methodology, taking into consideration Caltrans's unique linear, linear infrastructure. Provide timely review of approval of its assessments to help align feasible compliance actions that align well with the existing frameworks. Clarify statewide receiving water uh, monitoring requirements for the Caltrans MS4. Consider alternative compliance credit for local partnership projects, for instances where retrofitting on system is deemed infeasible. Next slide, please. 
This slide shows the compliance process and the need to collaborate to align it with our existing funding frameworks. I would like to define two acronyms that are used in this slide to explain the funding process. SHSMP stands for the State Highway System Management Plan, a performance-driven 10-year plan for the state highway system that contains maintenance, rehabilitation, operational needs, available investments, and resulting performance projections. These plans are developed in the odd years, uh, for example, 2023, 2025, and 2027. The other acronym is the SHOP, S-H-O-P-P, stands for the State Highway Operations and Protection Program, a portfolio of projects that follows the needs and performance metrics defined in the SHSMP. This is a four-year program updated every two years in the even years, which is 2022, 2024, and 2026. The California Transportation Commission has the authority to adopt funding for SHOP in the even years. Funding for stormwater compliance actions has to be programmed through SHOP for implementing standalone BMP retrofit projects, funding local partnerships, or BMP retrofits through multi-asset projects that rehabilitate our core assets, pavement, bridges, culverts, and traffic management systems. As shown in the graphic, the, pro the projected timelines for submittal and approval of the TMDL and trash control compliance plans are expected by the state board by September 2023, which will allow us to complete the scoping documents by December 2024 for authorization of funds by CTC at the earliest through the 2026 shop. We ask that the state board and regional boards facilitate timely review and approval of the TMDL and trash control implementation plans and establishing clarity and consistency in the required compliance actions uh, so we can align them with the existing funding frameworks and minimize the impacts to shop funding. This will ex help accelerate implementation of compliance actions again through on-system retrofits and engaging with external stakeholders to build regional multi-benefit treatment systems. Next slide, please. On behalf of Caltrans, I would like to reaffirm that Caltrans is committed to environmental stewardship and compliance to ensure that the maximum water quality benefit and the best environmental outcome is achieved through our compliance actions. As stewards of the transportation system for all Californians, we are committed to drive efficiency through effective use of limited state resources, and we look forward to continue to collaborate with state board staff to discuss resolution of our comments as we develop technical and fiscally feasible compliance actions that are compatible with both state and Caltrans's mission. Uh, that ends my presentation, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you as well. I uh, appreciate the, the good presentation, Mr. Takar, and uh, the, the comments here. I, um, actually, before we, we move on to our, our uh, public commenters here, I do actually have just uh, a quick uh, couple questions and invite the board colleagues if they have the same. Um, on the issue of funding, um, and I know here, gosh, it was slide number nine. Um, you know, when you discuss the 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 misalignment or the delay of alignment with exist the, the existing funding frameworks, and again, the timeline was actually helpful as well to kind of um, lay lay things out there. Um, what is what happens to then the funds that are sort of in cycle, and will it actually delay, or as I saw in your timeline, are we just needing to hit a sweet spot there between when um, you know the the your funding plans are are developed or the consideration for them are, and when the statewide implementation plan is submitted, uh, again here it's saying that you know it's it's going to be delayed um, uh, this some alignment with that funding, and just wanting to make sure that we're we're doing as best we can to um, make sure we're hitting. Uh, and you know, 2026 sounds you know, quite a long time uh, from now when it comes to when, you know, dollars may be actually flown from Caltrans in response to some of this work. But, you know, I know we haven't even adopted. It's not for next year. There's a year that's tacked on there. Again, just kind of trying to reflect on those sort of funding uh, constraints or timelines here, trying to unpack better, you know, if there's anything we can do to kind of help there other than uh, the request here to um, just prioritize the uh, waste load allocations for, um, for the trash in the plans. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Chair Esquivel, for that question. Um, our 
process um, right from the inception of the project, from planning all the way through funding and completion of construction is when we actually can claim credits for towards DMDL compliance or trash uh, control compliance. Um, that process from planning to completion of construction can take anywhere from four to six years um, uh, to complete that process at, at the best case. Um, the, the, the planning process starts once the uh, initial purpose and need is defined for, for the standalone retrofit projects or the multi-asset projects where we are trying to um, do implement BMP retrofits through our uh, projects that are uh, rehabilitating our core assets. So, so or, or if you're partnering through local partnerships. So it all starts with the initial purpose and need and defining uh, the project concept. So it's very critical that we, we have clarity and in, in what a clear path to compliance in terms of, you know, what are the waste load allocations and what are the credits or, or, or treatment um, areas that will count towards significant trash generation area compliance in terms of trash control requirements. So that clarity is, is very important. We do, uh, we, we are able to, in some cases, advance some of these projects where the opportunities do exist. Um, and, uh, but typically, I think once we start the planning process and, and, and a lot of that planning process, in this case, we're, we're unable to start that um, until the, the TMDL compliance plan uh, is approved. And as far as the trash uh, control implementation plan, that uh, we have submitted a plan in 2019. So, so implementation of those activities under those plans are already underway. So we are programming projects right now through the 2022 shop and we'll be programming for the 2024 shop and, and then subsequent shop uh, cycles as well. It's just the, that the TMDL compliance plans right now um, uh, we, we need, I think the TSO clearly defines the waste load allocations in some cases for Caltrans, but there are uh, cases there where we have to work with the regional boards uh, to establish the Caltrans specific waste load allocation requirements. So, so there's some work that still needs to get done. So there is a potential for delay in some of those uh, implementation requirements. And that's what we're trying to highlight here. I think the sooner we get clarity on, on what the target is, um, it'll help us um, uh, manage manage the programming process for, for those projects. Hey, thank you, I appreciate that. And helping better understand the alignment of your uh, planning processes and the funds that flow from them and, and then the work here that we're contemplating. So. Thank you. And Thank I guess my, my only other question is just a, a follow up and you did um, uh, bring it up slightly was just uh, how how are uh, collaborations incorporated into some of that discussion? You know, here, particularly, I think of the LA region, think of Measure W and the funds that are flowing from um, other uh, MS4 permittees uh, under similar uh, work here to reduce trash. And there's uh, certainly economies of scale that come to mind and the challenges and constraints that you've brought up with the right of ways um, and being able to, to you know, design out projects that do things like infiltrate and not just kind of move, move down through the system uh, amounts. Um, you know, what, what is that uh, more of kind of an informal sort of uh, process in some of your work or just trying to get a sense of how best to continue to seed what I see as, um, again, uh, opportunities of economies of scale seeing as how you have other permittees that are also looking to address uh, these similar watershed challenges with trash, its movement, and, and how it's, uh, it does so across multiple systems. Um, yes, we, we are, um, we, I think what we do is in terms of uh, advancing a municipal coordination program, we are engaged with uh, the watershed management programs in Southern California and in Northern California through um, the, the Bay Area Municipal Stormwater Collaborative. It's a consortium of all, all the municipal stormwater permittees and that we try to meet with them on a, on a monthly basis. And uh, in Southern California, we're also participating in the watershed management plans or the enhanced watershed management plans. Through that process, we are getting the message out in, in terms of what are the criteria that we uh, have set up for selecting projects that we can part, partner on or we can't fund and then the criteria are, are pretty straightforward. I think what we're looking for is we need the hydraulic connectivity 
from Caltrans right away to the local MS4 systems. And that is the first item we look for. So we can, we can clearly establish what the trash load reduction uh, requirements will be, how we will be able to meet those benchmarks, and also establish waste load reductions towards CMDL compliance. And in some cases, we, you know, we, we are able to work with the regional boards to claim credits for off-system right away that, uh, towards TMDL compliance. Um, and uh, so those agreements have to be entered into with the local partners and, 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 and achieve consensus with the local regional boards before we begin the programming process. So, so yeah, we are, we're actively involving ourselves. And if there are groups out there that we have not reached out to or we have, uh, that we are not aware of, uh, certainly they're welcome to, to contact us. And, uh, but we, we have both in Southern California and Northern California, we've, we've, we've built these relationships over the last few years and we've implemented a significant amount of funding has already been committed to these efforts. Great, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, highlighting that. Thank you. And yeah, it you know, can't help but, um, to my mind, think of it's a you know a data and systems exercise. Truly, when you talk about those endpoints between your MS4 systems and those of other permittees, and figuring out where where those overlap opportunities are, and just trying to you know, better seed those uh, amongst the communities and the local leaders that it takes to actually bring those projects to bear. So, just thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, board colleagues with uh, questions or comments here? And we do have about three individuals um, looking to comment on this as well. So we can go to them. Okay. Hearing none, then we can uh, move to our first um, uh, commenter here, uh, Dahlia Fidel. And you should be invited here to unmute or share your camera. Yes, hello. Can you hear hello. me? Hello. Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Okay, I'm sorry uh, if there is a little bit of background noise, but um, hi, my name is Dahlia Pablo. I'm, I'm a principal engineer with the city of Rancho Cordova, but I'm actually providing these comments today on behalf of the CASA Board of Directors and uh, California Storm Water Quality Association Board of Directors, and I'm the vice chair of the board. Um, and we wanted to provide comments on the Caltrans permits and focus on um, two areas. The first is the trash amendments, and the second is the TMDL implementation. So first off, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide comments. Um, Regarding the trash amendments, uh, CASCA's overarching goal is to ensure that permit language is consistent with the statewide trash amendment language, and that it builds off the implementation of the trash plans that have been submitted to date, while adding specificity where necessary to enhance the accountability during the term of the permit for trash reduction required by the trash amendments. However, uh, the Caltrans permit, we feel includes um, provisions that seem to deviate from this goal. Um, more specifically, uh, for sections 3.2 and 3.3, 3 .3, uh, the two sections do not reference each other. So it's not very clear that if all of the provisions in section 3.2 are being implemented, that that basically, uh, means compliance is achieved or um, that compliance um, is, uh, yeah, is it, basically achieved. So the, we feel that the two sections should really reference each other. Um, section 3.3 just uh, makes a reference to attachment E, which includes a lot of the details about the trash plan submittals, uh, what's considered, you know, full capture devices and things like that but it does not actually refer back to the provisions in section 3.2. Um, so that's the first comment. The second comment is regarding um, the use of corporate agreements as a mechanism for demonstrating compliance with TMDL requirements. Um, I know it has been already noted, um, but uh, from CASCA's perspective, um, uh, there has been multiple testimonies uh, in front of the State Water Board before um, regarding the hurdle of um, 
basically sources of funding for local municipalities and that municipalities have sought um, other sources of funding, including collaborating with Caltrans under these cooperative agreements. Um, the compliance unit approach in the previous iteration of the Caltrans permit provided a source of funding for a lot of these mun municipality watershed projects that, and some were hugely successful um, and used um, basically to achieve um, CMDL compliance. So we would like to make sure that the new permit, um, you know, still continues to incentivize Caltrans in supporting um, these watershed projects and uh, make sure that uh, it doesn't create any additional barriers for Caltrans to participate in these agreements with local municipalities or create any delays. And I think some of that has already been mentioned, but we just kind of wanted to reiterate the point. Fantastic, thank you. Really appreciate your, your good comments. Was, was there anything further, Ms. Battle? No, that was it. And again, I apologize for the background noise. Oh, it's okay. There, there wasn't any at all. And uh, you came through clearly. So thank you. Um, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, I'll just note that I'll, I'll kind of want to have a follow up with some of our uh, programmatic folks. Um, you know, there was a, a good point uh, regarding the transition from the compliant point uh, approach here to uh, waste load allocations. I can see where it will be more um, specific to then uh, the waste load sort of uh, uh, portion and need for for Caltrans and may I don't know may shift uh, the opportunities to to get projects um, or dollars to other projects that you know it seems maybe the point system created more fungibility around so uh, just to flag for folks okay uh, Mr Sean Bothwell uh, is who we have next good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and board members. Uh, my name is Sean Bothwell. I am the executive director for California Coastkeeper Alliance. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here today. And I just want to say real fast, um, your staff's been amazing on, on this permit uh, and the stakeholder outreach has been uh, really appreciated on, on my part. And so I, I just want to say that from the outset. Um, I also have a couple of positive things I want to highlight to begin with. Um, and then moving into some of the things uh, we would like to see fixed. But um, some of the things that we're really supportive of and happy about um, this change from the TMDL credit program to you know, changing the waste load all, uh, allocations to effluent limits. Um, we're really appreciative and supportive. Thanks staff for recognizing that the, the previous program wasn't working. Um, we weren't too thrilled with that program back in 2012. Um, you know, we thought give it a chance, but we're really happy to see this transition into the effluent limits and, and definitely support staff's uh, really hard work on, on working with the regional boards and Caltrans to, to get that, those translations right. Um, another thing we're really happy about is we brought to your staff's attention, um, Caltrans will mow their right-of-ways and the shoulders of their freeways um, while there's plastic and trash on their right-of-ways. And when they mow it, it just shreds it up to to either become airborne or it's just more pieces of trash. Um, and it's been really frustrating to a lot of our water keepers that go out there and you know, clean, clean different areas, um, including uh, you know, stretches of, of highway. And so that was something really important to our water keepers. And we really support um, staff adding that to the permit. I do have one small, well, maybe small um, request. And that is the, the provision that was added uh, was put into the stormwater management plan, kind of just tucked away there is just kind of a small provision. And it would be really nice if we could just elevate that a little more, possibly as a, a prohibition in the permit itself, just really putting some attention on there that, that that needs to be done because I'm afraid if it's just in the stormwater management plan, it, it's just gonna kind of maybe get glossed over. Um, and then the third thing we're really happy about and really appreciate staff doing is um, this the ASBS compliance. Um, you've heard from me before during the triennial review uh, that you know basically we feel like the ASBS exception policy is, is broken um, it needs to be re-evaluated re, re and, and fixed. Um, but we really appreciate the State Water Board for stepping in and, you know, resources are tight. I realize, you know, it's going to be a while before we might be able to get to that. And so kind of this is almost a stopgap measure to, to try to fix some of the stuff we can in the permits themselves. Um, I think is a really good idea and an efficient way to kind of fix that program. Um, so we're really supportive of staff putting that in there. Um, I do have, again, a, a slight 
uh, thing to flag there. Um, we've been requesting um, that there be BMP effectiveness uh, monitoring or some type of monitoring after the compliance plan is implemented uh, to demonstrate that they're now um, in compliance with the ASBS exception. And as far as I understand, that's not in there right now. I, at the workshop a couple of weeks ago, I asked staff if there was monitoring required because I thought I had heard that. Um, and they, uh, what I had heard was that, no, not necessarily. They already had to do the monitoring, but it was flagged for me. Um, and I had seen the paragraph in attachment C where it talks about uh, the strategy to demonstrate compliance. That's what they call it. And, and monitoring is a possible option there. And so my request is just to, uh, you know, the strategy to demonstrate, just, just make there be a very clear provision that they need to demonstrate uh, that they're now in compliance with the ASBS exception is my request. So again, those three things very supportive of. A couple of things to flag that uh, we feel needs more attention. Uh, first, uh, looking at the Caltrans facilities themselves, um, there's not a lot of oversight on the actual facilities. You know, I understand uh, the representative monitoring, you know, it's miles and miles of linear highway. And so obviously the, the kind of regional monitoring might be the best fit there, um, but there's not any monitoring for the facilities themselves. And there's also the, the inspections are a little lackluster. And so we really feel like there's no oversight of those facilities. So our request is um, to require some individual monitoring, not all of them, but just prioritize some facilities based on the size and the threat to water quality given those facilities. Um, and then another request is um, to use third party monitoring. And I'm not just saying citizen monitoring, but uh, other groups that are doing this type of regional monitoring or even in industrial stormwater folks. Uh, take that type of third-party monitoring and use it to better inform Caltrans's stormwater management plan, and also uh, use that monitoring to satisfy the requirement that Caltrans is, is aware of that they're causing or contributing to a receiving water limitation exceedance. And we'll outline this a little more in detail of wh why we're trying to get this, but there is that data out there, and it's not being incorporated into what Caltrans is actually doing. So th that's our request there. Um, on inspections, um, we've, we've been looking at inspection reports and they seem very cursory and almost like it's a cut and paste job where we don't really know how much like real inspection is going on. And because there's no oversight and there's no monitoring, that's really the only oversight of these facilities right now. Uh, so we have three requests. Um, one, consider having municipalities have the authority uh, to do site inspections for Caltrans facilities. Uh, two, for the water boards to do some type of spot reviews of these inspections to kind of see what we're seeing that, um, and just to ensure that they're actually, these site, site inspections are actually meaningful. Um, and then it would, what would be nice is maybe like a photo, maybe two photos with the metadata of who took it, when, where, and just require that as part of the report so that there's some confidence there that they're actually going out and, and doing the inspection rather than just cutting and pasting from a former inspection. Uh, next, um, independent contractors or subcontractors. There is a provision in the permit uh, to require subcontractors and uh, to, to seek IGP coverage if they're doing such activities. Um, but again, we're pretty, we're concerned that th that's just not happening. Um, so our request would be to have an affirmative requirement uh, for Caltrans to notify the state and regional board when one of its contractors is required to enroll. So it's kind of like the MS4 permittees where they're required to file not or report non-filers to the regional board. It's kind of similar concept there. Um, and then lastly, and then I, I wanted to respond to just two things I had heard um, earlier. On the TSOs, um, we, you know, we don't oppose the TSOs. We understand that's a tool and toolbox to bring folks into compliance. Uh, so we don't have necessarily an issue with it, but you know, there, there's a lot of TMDLs in that tier three and, and we just, we're going to dig into the permit more and we'll outline this more in the comments, but I am concerned about how Caltrans is going to demonstrate compliance with the interim milestones, given that the compliance schedules have already passed. Um, and then what is the repercussion if they don't meet those milestones? If that could be better outlined in the permit, um, I, th I think that would make us feel a lot better just because of, you know, it's been nine years since the, the credit program and we really want to see there be some movement. Um, and to that point, just two responses to one th things I've heard um, on the funding alignment, <coughs> excuse me, on the funding alignment um, that Caltrans mentioned, I just wanted to point out that these TM TMDLs are not new. Um, they've been in Caltrans's permit already. They should already be investing money in, in fixing these. So, so, you know, it gives me a little concern when we're doing a TSO for 62 TMDLs that have already passed. Um, and now we're talking about further delays. So just, I understand and appreciate, you know, 
making sure that there's good governance, making sure things are in alignment. But just, just I just want to point that out that these have been around for quite a while now. And then the last thing um, that uh, the speaker before me said on the trash provisions, um, I just want to remind the board that the trash amendments have two very distinct sections, and they're in different chapters of, of the, the amendments. One is the water quality objective itself that says no trash shall be present in our waterways. And then the other one is the trash prohibition. They're, they're two separate and distinct things. And the trash prohibition then to comply with that, you need to do track one or track two. But that doesn't mean just because you've complied with the trash prohibition that you've complied with the water, the receding water quality objective. And this came up in the Salinas permit, which sadly has been the only um, storm on a permit that's incorporated the trash amendments to date. And this came up um, and we raised concerns about exactly what I just said. Um, and it was reviewed by your staff and legal, I believe. Um, and they, they changed the permit to comply with, um, well, to, to adjust it to what we had said. So this has been brought up before um, and we had fixed it before, but I just wanted to remind the board of, of that issue. So with that, um, we're gonna submit comments and provide recommendations, but thank you very much for the time. And um, I really appreciate everything. And thank you for your time and good comments. I uh, appreciate it, Mr. Bothell, took, took some notes, appreciate it. Next, we have Vico Allen. Hello. Thanks, Good afternoon. Uh, Chair Escobel, um, I and uh, members of the board. I appreciate the, the time to speak here. I um, have some uh, very brief comments here, so I um, won't keep you long. In particular, I'd like to, to speak to section uh, C1010, which is about vector control. Um, in that uh, section there, there's a requirement that uh, post-construction best management practices um, drain within 96 hours unless they're designed to control vectors through other features. This is similar language to what was in the, uh, the previous permit. And that is a good recommendation. Um, however, it's a little bit vague. The uh, control vectors through other features part has been interpreted in the past by, by Caltrans as meaning essentially a standing water prohibition. Um, that in combination with a, with a memo that's from 2007, um, also recommending um, uh, no standing water. Um, since then, things have changed a bit um, on the vector control side. Um, no longer do we just have the Culex mosquitoes to worry about, which are the ones that transmit West Nile virus, but there are also other mosquitoes that don't uh, lay their eggs on in standing water. Um, the Aedes uh, mosquitoes that can transmit Zika virus and yellow fever and other things. So um, the thinking I think of the vector control agencies has evolved a bit, and we can see this in the full trash capture certification process, um, as I'm sure board and staff are, are aware. Um, in that process for certification of full trash capture systems, um, any device is required to go through the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California uh, review process. And uh, those systems that have issues, uh, particularly with, with inspectability and uh, treatability, um, are either required to fix those issues or they just don't get approved. So essentially, we have a, a group of, of systems here that have been approved by the state um, board uh, for full trash capture that have been through vector control uh, review and approval. And I would like to see in this permit some recognition of that to, to kind of take away some of the vagaries of uh, controlling vectors through other features. So I, I will make specific comments to this effect, but I think it would be very easy to just put a, a sentence in here that says something to the effect of, you know, full trash capture systems that have been certified by the state board will be considered to have met this requirement of controlling vectors through other features. Um, the reason that this is important is because we want to have, uh, you know, maximum number of options available to Caltrans to meet their trash control obligations. And I know we, we talk about um, multiple benefits a lot, um, usually meaning heat island effect and habitat and recreation and things. But as we're controlling trash, there's also an opportunity for uh, multiple benefits like controlling sediment and controlling oil, uh, controlling other waterborne pollutants that are really best done and kind of only done in systems that do have a, a, a wet sump for standing water for some period of time. Um, so that concludes my comments for now and stay tuned for written comments on the same subject. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Really appreciate that uh, additive and good comment. Uh, I believe, uh, Ms. Hart, uh, you have your hand up by all means here. Let me, I think, see if I'm able to uh, invite you and or unmute you. Well, I'll let the, the professionals do so. Hi there, are you able to hear me? We can. Okay, I, I, I'm not able to start my video, but at least you can hear me. Um, yes, good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Lindsay Hart. I am Chief of Staff for the Maintenance and Operations Program at Caltrans. 
And uh, I was here today to uh, help answer any questions or, or address any questions that might arise on the Clean California proposal um, that we that was just announced by the governor a couple of months ago and just uh, officially launched this month. And so. Uh, seeing as there were no questions, I thought we would be remiss to not mention this as it does obviously make a significant impact in the elimination of trash on the state transportation network and also on our local streets and roads. And so I just wanted to briefly make sure that I acknowledge some of the highlights of this program and some of the benefits that we expect to see over the next three years. And then I did want to see if there were any specific questions from the board that I can help answer. So. Um, I, this is likely very familiar to, to you, but uh, just to kind of reiterate, this is really an unprecedented investment in the elimination of trash from the transportation network. And again, this is not just on the state transportation system, but also on our local streets and roads. And so over the next three years on the state system alone, we anticipate the elimination of an additional 1.2 million cubic yards of trash and litter. Um, this will, we, we anticipate that this will not just be a one-time elimination. Uh, this proposal is really a holistic approach to eliminating trash in that there's a strong public education and engagement component. Um, we're also seeking to implement a number of community-based uh, beautification projects, and we're partnering with a number of great organizations at the state level and also the local levels in all of our 12 districts to really try and get our communities engaged in being a part of the solution so we can stop trash at the source, um, but also so that we can tackle all of the trash that is accumulating on our system. Um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a significant increase in trash uh, for a number of reasons, um, including the, the transport of goods um, and the additional reliance on purchasing uh, your goods online, which comes with additional packaging that slides off onto our system. Um, so there's a, a kind of a historic investment here that's happening over the next three years in litter abatement, and then there's also a local grant program. Caltrans will be launching its first uh, public uh, hearing, or not hearing, I apologize, but uh, public meeting in September to give more information to cities and counties on how they can compete uh, for this funding. And we will be working to try to give as many grants as possible across the state to help on the local system. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer any of those detailed questions at this time. Thank you so much, Ms. Hart. Really appreciate uh, you joining us here and making sure to flag. It was gonna be uh, something I was gonna bring up. I know I had brought it up with um, uh, Jonathan Bishop, our chief deputy, as, as this item was uh, coming before us because I, it really did come to mind. I know that incredible investment that is being made in beautification and its nexus here between water quality and trash and these programs are just very strong. So I appreciate the, the partnership with Caltrans here, both on the permit, but then also on uh, the, the work generally here and appreciate the emphasis, of course, on, on communities who are overburdened oftentimes by trash um, in, uh, in, in our most uh, disadvantaged of communities. And so, you know, we really need to make sure we're targeting these resources and improving uh, the communities uh, that need it most here. Um, and there's, a definite nexus with how best to make this investment in a way that creates long-term uh, reductions in the amounts of trash we see in our water, in our our, our our landscape, but importantly, as it makes its way through stormwater and, and everything uh, through uh, to, to our oceans and, and out. So uh, just, I the only question I would have is um, if there will be, uh, like when the next uh, real opportunity, either a workshop or engagement, around um, some of the uh, continued unveiling of the prioritization of funds or just the opportunities generally. It would be great to, um, you know, here I encourage maybe working really with the regional boards as well to, to host an item um, as funding becomes available and use the, the regional boards and their purview around uh, implementation of the trash policy, but these challenges with water quality to, to really highlight and, and further um, ensure this, this collaborative work between our agencies, which again has yielded well on these permits, and now uh, even here with this incredible investment, uh, can really you know maximize the uh, opportunities we have amongst us all. So, just uh, thank you for that. And if there's you know any uh, specific uh, public engagement coming up soon that it would be helpful to flag, that'd be great. Then otherwise, um, just look forward to a continued programmatic integration here around uh, the work around trash generally, but then also these investments that help reduce it uh, here in the long term. 
Absolutely. I appreciate your comments and acknowledgement of this investment. Uh, we are in the planning phase, but we are moving uh, rapidly to get more details out. So uh, working with the regional water boards is certainly a top, on top of our list. So we will certainly do that and share that information with both the state and regional boards as soon as it's available. Thank you so much, really. Uh, other board members, any uh, questions or comment? Okay, thank you. And thank you, Ms. Hart. Thank you. Um, so this obviously is just a workshop. Uh, this is just a discussion here on the permit, uh, but is there any uh, further sort of question, follow-up uh, points uh, that my fellow colleagues would like to bring up here? Hearing none. Well, good. Thank you, everyone. That concludes this workshop then on this item and brings item number six uh, to a close. Thanks everyone for the comment and engagement here. That then now brings us to item number seven, which is our board member reports. We're wrapping up here and coming to the end of today's meeting. Uh, board members, anyone would like to kick us off on any activities um, that they'd like to report back on? And I quickly apologize pulling up my calendar here in order to see if I have the same. I can, I can note mine while you're looking, Chair. I Thank only you. have one to report, and that is an event that uh, you and I attended, um, hosted by um, Congressman Harder. Um, he hosted a meeting on, well, focused on drought, but um, really, um, I think, um, wise of him to be looking at more of a dialogue on short-term solutions and long-term solutions. Uh, the, the It was at... Um, Stanislaus County Farm Bureau's office and the room was full of a lot of local stakeholders, elected officials, and um, including some members of the Board of Supervisors and local mayors. And I just really enjoyed the opportunity to get an update on some of the uh, local uh, drought resilient projects that they're looking at. Um, they gave us an update on a recycled water project, but also more importantly, sort of the same group that worked on that North Valley project is um, looking at an off stream um, small reservoir and of course groundwater recharge. And so it was a good opportunity to um, uh, talk with folks about some of the uh, local programs that they're looking at and also um, an opportunity for um, uh, the chair and I to give an update on some of our programs on, on drought actions. And then um, Secretary Ross was there and she gave an update on um, uh, the governor's May revise and some of the actions that are you know, pending before the legislature on additional um, funding opportunities. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yeah, it was a really great opportunity to make sure we're aligning both at the local, state, and federal level uh, on our efforts. And just uh, really appreciated the, the Congressman pulling us together, being able to provide a forum for us to communicate the work that the board is doing, but more importantly, hear about the challenges in the community. And the way that uh, already creative projects have gone out there, like the water recycling that goes on in the region that goes to agriculture and helps buffer uh, these challenging times. So. Um, I know that it also goes to the Grassland Water District. So there's an ecosystem component with the water recycling going on there. Incredibly innovative when you think of the, the sorts of projects that we're seeing and needing in the West um, and gonna need to continue to see uh, how we share uh, what is uh, particularly here with this drought front of mind, uh, always a, a, a precious and um, not overabundant resource for us in the West. So. Just thank you, Vice Chair. The only other thing I would add um, besides that, that item uh, for my own report is just um, on the 12th, it was the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee uh, meeting. Um, it is uh, known as DPIC and um, hosted by the chair of the Delta Stewardship Council, uh, Susan Tutayan. And so uh, it was a great discussion. Um, one of the panels was led by Chuck Bonham on ecosystem restoration in the face of drought or ecosystem response in the face of drought. We had our Delta Water Master as well, Mr. Uh, Michael George uh, presenting. It was, it was a good and robust discussion as always. DPIC is an opportunity for the state, local and federal agencies here again, common theme to gather, to make sure we're, we're discussing and coordinating uh, on the Delta. And so really appreciated the, the leadership of uh, the chair and um, 
uh, directing that meeting. Uh, that is uh, all I have. Any other board uh, members with reports? Well, I, I don't really have a report, but I like to tell stories. So I'll do that. Um, so, my, so last week I was on vacation and um, took my, my family down to Mount Whitney. Uh, so actually, so my son could climb the, the summit there, which he successfully did. I did not, I didn't attempt, he, he attempted. So we're one for one there in the family. So that was good. Um, but, you know, for me, it's always just an amazing experience driving down uh, 395 in the Eastern Sierras and seeing the resources that we have there. So stopping um, with my family at Mono Lake, uh, looking at the South Tufa area there, um, just remarking on the board's actions after the Audubon decision um, and our public trust responsibility. And so that was just a really unique opportunity for me to share that experience um, with my family and the, um, the opportunity that we've had at the board to really um, engage in both stream restoration and also lake uh, level restoration activities there. And um, so much has been accomplished over the past few decades. Um, more work is needed there. And you know, there's a, a, a water rate change petition that's in process now that hopefully will result in um, some um, changes to how the um, Brush Creek is operated there, which will provide you know, enhanced flows for the fishery. Um, but you know, at the same time, I also saw you know, many of the effects of, of climate change in the drought there, even um, with lake levels continuing to recede. So a lot of challenges. And I just wanted to put a pin in this for you all. Um, for those of you who haven't been there before, I've been, um, I'm very hopeful that sometime perhaps next year, um, maybe um, when we're back together in person, we can uh, make a trip out to that area and uh, either having a meeting out there or just a tour or some sort of uh, um, an opportunity to reflect on, on that decision and our, our commitments to the lake and also just public trust generally. So just wanted to share that little uh, sidebar with you all and uh, look forward to uh, tackling that more in the future. Thank you, board member. Always really critical to reconnect to, to all this. I appreciate the, the story. And, and the reflection on the on the vacation. Thank you. Other board members? I'll go. Um, let's see. So I wanted to highlight a couple uh, issues I've been focusing on more than more than events. Um, so one is just following up on the racial equity resolution workshop that we had. There's a couple issues I've been um, having some good dialogues around, um, but I wanted to just flag for the full board since we're together. And this is a chance to do that. Um, one is I uh, had a good conversation around how to um, better ensure that um, the SEPs, the Supplemental Environmental Programs that um, our regional boards and state board for that matter, enforcement teams are able to enter into can um, support uh, grassroots environmental justice, racial equity um, uh, efforts in impacted communities. And I know this is something that folks have worked on for a long time. We have a SEP policy, we have an enforcement policy, um, but there's I think still some work to figure out how to better uh, facilitate those types of projects um, getting, being able to be uh, selected and implemented. So that's something that, um, you know, I really appreciate um, Vaughn and other folks just looking into sort of considering how we might do that um, as a more kind of quick thing um, that uh, maybe doesn't need a, a whole drastic revision and policy to be able to start implementing. Um, the other thing like that is just, you know, this is um, BCP, everything is BCP season of sort of trying to figure out how to prepare um, for, uh, you know, what we're going to need resource wise and staff wise to continue to do our work each year. And um, one of the things I really, uh, you know, hope that we can see as we look at that, as we look at hiring new staff, is just how we are able to um, 
diversify the classifications that we use um, and create more pipelines for um, you know, some of the, the classifications that aren't as well represented at the board. Um, and I know that was something that was uh, flagged in, during the, the racial equity workshop as well. So I think my hope is that we can um, you know, continue on that effort. Um, I know there's been a lot of short-term, not short-term, but more immediate things, sort of low-hanging fruit that we've been able to do around hiring and recruitment um, and are trying to do more, build on more and more. But I think this, you know, as we, as we are posting and hiring more positions, just really taking a deliberate look at what we can do to diversify that and bring in additional types of expertise. Um, and other things um, are, um, I, you know, our staff have been working hard on, you know, figuring out how we're going to um, uh, administer the arrearages program. And we finally, you know, got some clarity from the legislature on what the guidelines and requirements for that billion dollars um, that we need to implement are. Um, that just happened. So we're still, I think, figuring out how to how to make sure that we're able to move that forward effectively. But we did hear and are coordinating more with um, CSD and their um, implementation of the federal arrearages debt forgiveness program. And just to update folks on that is that we um, there's a lot of restrictions coming from the feds. And I think it's very different than, you know, what we're doing at the state level, which is a much more flexible, trying to be extremely efficient and flexible in terms of getting money out to folks. The federal program is extremely um, uh, process and um, eligibility restrictive. And so I think, you know, CSD is going to be going through the process of, of submitting a plan really quick here, I think beginning of August, um, for how they would implement the program, that federal program at the state. But it's a, um, you know, it's an order of magnitude, less money. <laughs> so I think the hope is that we can um, marry the two well, and I know we're coordinating well on that, but I just wanted to give the board an update on that because we got some more clarity on that. And um, I know this is something the board has really cared about and led on in terms of the survey work um, that we started and was helping to inform that. And I'm sure we're, we will be hearing a lot more about um, how we're gonna be approaching this. Um, and then lastly, you know, I've been participating um, in, uh, as well as a number of staff with the board um, in an effort that the US Water Alliance has pulled together around catalyzing consolidation and partnership in California and really looking at how um, we can uh, identify strategies to really accelerate um, and catalyze the kind of scale and number um, and scope of consolidations that I that you know we have as a um, a goal in terms of solving a lot of the um, kind of long-term capacity needs of of the many many fragmented small water systems and um, there's been one convening so far that really looked at feasibility studies and kind of analyses and information and tools that could help early on set kind of a good um, community understanding and narrative of what is being discussed and what are those trade-offs um, rather than kind of just having um, that be at the end where there may be um, not as good information and kind of a narrative that's that doesn't help the project contend. Um, and then uh, looking at uh, technical capacity, the, the next convening is looking at technical capacity and how to expand that given the number and scope of what we're doing um, and the, the sort of handful of service providers that we have covering the state. Um, and, uh, and then there's two other convenings. I'm not quite sure what all of those are, but there's, um, I think the, the goal here is to um, pretty quick come up with some support for um, strategizing how we can accelerate um, and more effectively get the 
consolidations and just projects done in the state, um, which I think is going to be really helpful for us with the SUPER program, obviously, and all we're doing. And that's really complementing um, and, and involving our staff. I just really appreciate all the efforts that they're doing on it um, and have been doing before this effort, but I think it's a good chance to share that and hear more. Um, so I think those are the things I wanted to update. Thank you, board member. Uh, board member Morgan, I think you were, you said you were good. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. I don't have anything to report um, right now. I'm just yeah, getting still. my feet under me and I'm also, you know, looking forward to starting to get out into the build, doing some site visits and seeing some of our projects firsthand. Great, great. Thank you. Um, now we can move on. Uh, that concludes board member reports and we can move on to our last item uh, for today. And that is uh, our executive director's report. Ms. Sobeck. Uh, thank you, Chair Esquivel. Um, I don't have anything to allow um, within my report to highlight. I did just want to mention that um, the Tamarack fire, which is burning up near Markleyville, um, you know, ironically, it was, it was caused by a um, a lightning strike during the 4th of July weekend. I, I had was up in the area that weekend and thinking how great it was that we had um, a fairly good um, rainstorm with some hail, um, but it turns it turns out that that was not a good thing because of the lightning. I just wanted to let the board members know that um, that fire has burned within two miles of the Leviathan mine, which is a, um, an abandoned Superfund site that the that region six, um, our, our Lahontan region um, administers and that our board has made, um, oh gosh, I don't know how long it's been now, a year and a half or two years ago, um, we all did a field trip up there. So I, I think that most of our board members are um, aware of that site, but I just wanted to let um, everyone know that um, the um, executive officer and the board up there are watching things carefully. They're coordinating with our emergency office. They feel quite, um, quite sure that the emergency plan that they have in place um, is going to keep the mine safe. They have um, they have stripped down the personnel that are there for safety reasons because the road has um, been closed on and off. So um, everybody will keep watching that. We get um, our daily reports from Cal OES um, and we're in touch with the region. But I, in, in case people were wondering or looked at the maps and saw how close they were to those sites, um, we do have some direct other direct involvement besides our concerns with um, the, the surrounding communities, their water supplies, and and, and all of that. So I'll just leave it in that, at that unless uh, any board members have questions about the um, uh, my report. Yeah, just thank you, Ms. Sobek, for, for at least uh, making sure that we're aware of what are I know evolving conditions up there. And um, yeah, it's uh, I think most uh, individuals don't know, but uh, our region six, La Hunt region actually um, runs a super fun site. Uh, it's an abandoned mine up there. Um, quite the operation um, and I'm glad that our staff are safe, but importantly, Folks are continuing to monitor and, and trying to ensure the, the safety of, of all of everyone there. So thank you. And, and thank you as well for your leadership uh, when it comes to our coordination with the Department of Water Resources and Cal OES and all the drinking water work. You know, it's certainly not lost on, on me that, you know, between our drinking water work, water quality, water rights, um, there's a lot that we're, we're called to have to do here in the middle of this drought and let alone with wildfires also burning where the board has an important role. So just thank you for, for continuing to coordinate uh, all that. I know it's um, it's not easy, uh, especially answering to the five of us uh, on top of it. So thank you. Uh, well, that concludes our board meeting for today. We have, um, we'll continue this board meeting to tomorrow uh, as well. So we'll just be in recess until then. Uh, and there I believe we just have one item we are taking up. There's been a continuation of uh, the Simone item. So, uh, Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good rest of your uh, day here. Um, good few hours, uh, hopefully, of productive work for us board members. Um, and always nice to end a little a little early uh, the board on board meeting days. So um, we'll see you tomorrow. And have a great evening. And thank you. Talk to you soon.